everyone. I would like to call the September 22nd, 2020 Select Board meeting to order. This evening, um, we are broadcast on RCTV, Verizon Channel 33, Xfinity Channel 22, also available on Facebook Live, the link from RCTV and YouTube. For public comment, we'll be allocating uh, time at 715 um, we have, I believe, one person who is in queue to, to speak then. Um, and then we'll be going to the public hearing that will open at 7.30. We have a number of people that have already requested to speak at that, uh, at that activity as well. Just a quick reminder for everyone, the best place to find resources about the town in general, but also specific to COVID-19 or any questions you might have, is our website, readingma.gov. You can see links here. You can also send emails, um, human and elder services. You can see COVID-19 help. Um, we also would love to have people, if you're interested in, in helping, there's a specific email for volunteering as well as general questions. You can also call uh, Town Hall, 781-942-6680. There'll be a menu of options, um, which you can select from, leave your name and phone number. And as always, if there's an emergency, please just call 911. Mark, I was wondering, could we update this slide given some of the presentation we received from the Reading Coalition for Prevention and Support for emergencies, call 911, or the number um, that they provided if you're having a mental health emergency, there's there's an additional number you can call. That's a great idea. And do you happen to know that number now? Um, um, announce in a, in a minute after I- I'll Announce it in one minute. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a great idea. I think we should update this um, with that information on mental health support, uh, the phone number and actions. Great. Uh, in terms of tonight's agenda, so after this overview, um, we have Carrie Donnell from the Board of Health, uh, talk a little bit about COVID-19 response. We'll then do liaison reports and we've combined kind of town manager uh, discussion into that area as well. Public comment at 7.15. At 7.30, we will open the public hearing uh, to discuss issues related to downtown parking. At about 8.40, um, should be a presentation from the VASC uh, regarding Board of Health and ZBA, and we're planning to take votes on both of those this evening. About 8.50, we'll move to the warrant. Um, there are a few updates that are there and maybe a few discussion items. We do need to close the warrant this evening for November town meeting reflective both of the uh, town moderator's desire to go virtual for the meeting, as well as we need to close the warrant. <laughs> uh, at nine o'clock, we'll move on to um, the town manager's goals, uh, which are in the packet based on uh, the feedback that, that we gave to, to Bob at, at our last meeting. 945, um, we have on here a, a uh, related to the Auburn Street activities with the water tower. Um, to discuss the October 20th meeting logistics, how we want to run that meeting. And I wanted the board to have input into to what we're going to do for that. I have talked and have a little bit of input from the neighbors, but I want to make sure that, that we're in agreement on the format to use. Um, then we'll move on. We have one, we're all caught up on minutes up to our last meeting and those min uh, minutes are in the package. And then about 9.55, go on to future uh, meeting agenda topics. Um, and by any chance, did you find that phone number? Yes. So. This is for Elliott Emergency Services, which operates a 24-7 mobile service for psychiatric evaluation, crisis intervention, stabilization, and follow-up for children, adults, and elders in psychiatric distress. Uh, that number is 1-800-988. Oh, and then it says 111. I don't know if there's a, a missing digit there um, in the email that, that we have. Um, let me see if I click on the actual website, but, but I'm, rec I'm recalling that, um, um, it could take a couple hours for, for, um, for services to arrive, arrive. So you can always call 911 as well. Yeah. So when I, would, um, I think maybe we'll do, uh, we'll, I'm sure take a break at some point tonight. Maybe we'll find the, uh, the missing digit and yeah. we can, <laughs> update the information. That sounds good. Great. Um, okay, so let's move on to COVID-19 response. Um, Carrie, can I ask you to, to speak from the Board of Health, please? Hey, good evening. Um, so just briefly, you know, 
COVID-19 response continues. Um, we are in great shape. There still is only one hospital in the Commonwealth that is on um, surge capacity, which means that there are sufficient beds. Uh, what we're seeing is that cases, um, are there's not a lot of hospitalization. There continue to be cases. And I think that's the important point. There continue to be cases. People need to continue to wear face coverings, to honor the social distancing requirements. Um, we've been in great shape, but we, you know, we're not sure what's going to happen as the, the cooler weather comes in. Um, to prepare for that, the health department is working on flu clinics to immunize folks for the regular flu. And there's also been some great coordination with uh, the public health nursing nursing staff, the health staff, and the school nurses to talk about um, preparation for if there should be any instances of positive cases in the community, how will they coordinate, how will they um, respond, how will they share information. I um, had the opportunity to sit in on one of those meetings and I just want to say that I think I, it was it was very heartening. I was in, impressed. I, I, I was impressed by the collaboration, by the planning, by the uh, forethought that everyone was putting into it. It's really nice to see. And um, we're fortunate. Um, and then I think the only other thing is I'd say thank you to the VASC for meeting to um, fill our, um, to work to fill our vacancies. I don't know if there are any questions. Board members, any questions? Um, I have a couple of quick ones. One on the flu clinics. I um, suspect that you're going to tell me that as soon as possible is the planning timing at this point, and you'll have updates to share with us when you can. Yeah, I, I, I want to make sure that our dates are confirmed. We have dates, but I, I haven't seen it in, in, in writing yet. So I, I don't want to share a date and be wrong. But yes, there are um, some dispensing for uh, staff and the like and for um, for um, elders, that that's in the works, as well as a general public one being planned um, in the in late September and early and during October. Great, thank you. Any other questions? No, great, thank you, Carrie. Thanks for the update. Thanks, Bob. Um, Bob, anything you want to share from uh, command or other activities on COVID nineteen first? Um, sure, just very quickly. Um, <clears throat> Mark, you sat through the last command meeting. Uh, the notes are in the uh, packet. We spent a great deal of time on the, um, you know, Carl McFadden issue. Um, uh, two updates. One, um, within 24 hours of the meeting we had on Monday, we learned uh, through town council and the state that they were eff effectively exempt from almost everything we talked about. So we did a great deal of planning, um, and it was, you know, it was a good exercise, but it was for naught. Um, they had an exception um, under a, a, an executive order that we weren't aware of. I'm not sure if they were, but they found it out uh, the Thursday before. So um, all the review the town ended up doing was all based on change of use under zoning. So the property itself, nothing to do with pandemic, education, and so forth. It was all related to, uh, to the zoning change. And um, along those lines, I, I heard through social media uh, there was a complaint that we were spending too much time on that effort when we weren't doing others. That's the only one that's come to us. So if there's some other use out there other than five families in a, in a single family home, we need to know that. Again, no, uh, no business owner has come to us and said they're offering any kind of service like this. Um, and it could be that they're also exempt and it's a minor matter, but we don't know that. So, you know, if the community wants to, uh, let any of the staff know about it, we're certainly happy to work with someone. So that's all, Mark. So just for, for the benefit of the board, um, if you saw it in the command package, but to give you a little bit more color around it, um, the proposal was um, for uh, both curricular and extracurricular activities um, at the former Reading Athletic Club, if I have it right, um, and the, the Danish property down by Market Basket. And there was um, a lot of work that was put into exploring the requirements that would need to be met based on the state guidelines that were given to us. And I think the, the update Bob just gave us is that um, despite all of that, <laughs> there actually was an exemption that they have uh, been working with. And do we know what their status is now? Is that up and running? Is it planning to be up? They had an inspection this morning. I'm not sure if it was real or virtual. I think it was real. Um, and um, I expect to hear it tomorrow. I, I don't think they're open. Uh, but they had their EEC inspection this morning 
and they expect to hear back tonight or tomorrow morning. And they said it went well. Great. Okay. So um, the town's role at this point is inspectional services mostly. Um, yeah, we were done last week, um, and then we'll have to issue a, a, I think, Gene, is a final, final building permit necessary or not? We can't hear you, Gene. We've issued the building permit. So. Okay. So we're done. Okay. Great. Um, so, Bob, we'll, why don't we, uh, we'll do liaison, then come back to you for town manager, if that's all right. Okay. So um, next liaison reports, anyone have any, any updates that they would like to share? Vanessa. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so I, and I think others as well, went over to the water tower um, in the Auburn Street area to meet with residents. Um, I, we, I know later on we'll be discussing the logistics for the next meeting, um, but I did want to let the residents know if you're watching and you're from that area, um, we have heard your concerns. Um, we will be discussing them next week. Um, personally, I, just so the community is informed, um, I have significant reservations about the plan that's been put forward. Um, and I think we'll need extensive discussion um, and perhaps revisit the approach um, because I'm, I'm not comfortable with where it is now. Uh, that's all, thank you. And just to clarify, the October 20th, I think is the, the timing that we're talking about, not next week. Oh, yes, thank you. October 20th. Yeah, no problem. Other other comments? Uh, sorry, li uh, liaison reports. Yeah. Yes. So um, from the Board of Health, um, they are looking at the possibility of having a consultant conducting a health department assessment, um, which could result in recommendations, which could include but not be limited to hiring a health director. Uh, last night, they reviewed uh, and re and uh, revised a scope of work for said consultant um, and specified this needs to be conducted by a consultant with experience working in health departments and assessing departments um, to be submitted with a list of consultants for review by purchasing. Um, and my understanding um, from Bob is that any um, of uh, any funding transfers necessary to um, effectuate um, either this health department assessment and or the hiring of a health department, a health director. That for, and then there were some uh, emails and letters to us um, recommending that in our packet tonight that whatever is needed and decided by town meeting can be, would be uh, able to be accommodated under existing warrant articles um, in the as as are laid out in the packet. Great, thank you, Ann. Uh, and then Karen, Carlo, no. Well, I, Mark, thanks. I didn't attend, but I know CPDC had a busy meeting uh, last week uh, with the Chronicle Building. Uh, Running Animal Clinic is expanding uh, their property and a few other items, but I know the um, the board requested the developer to scale down the property on Main Street, the old Chronicle building down to 12 units, and they were gonna give back to the board to see if that was feasible. But as I understand it from what I read, it went from 19 to 16, and now they said 12, which would cut an entire floor. Um, so economically, he's gonna figure out if that makes sense. And um, again, I didn't attend, but I, I read a little bit about it. Great, thanks Carla. Karen. And just to follow up on that project, um, I am being CC'd by Colleen over at the general manager at RMLD. She's continuing ongoing discussions with the developer at 513 um, about um, natural gas alternatives, greener energy alternatives for powering that building. Um, including, you know, discussions for electrification of the heat, the cooking, um, um, and they are also still discussing a number of EV chargers um, in that building. So um, she's keeping me in the loop on that and conversations are going well. That's great. Thanks, Karen. Um, just one quick update. On, um, I'm sorry, Ann, go ahead. 
That's one additional report. I'd, I'd mentioned at our last meeting that HRAC was looking at um, bringing together our um, leg state legislative delegation for an event. And they are they have scheduled and are planning a listening to understand event um, to be held with, with Representative Haggerty, Representative Jones, and Senator Lewis. Um, and that is scheduled for Wednesday, October 7th at 6.30 p.m. You can find more information on the Human Relations Advisory Committee of Reading MA's uh, Facebook page. Great. It'll be a virtual event. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Uh, one quick update as it relates to uh, town meeting. There is a uh, an informal group that has already started discussions on the staff side about what uh, what we learned from the last one and what's required to to improve it and make it run well technologically and other ways. And there is a, a meeting coming up, um, I think next week to further those discussions. If any board members or residents have any comments that they would want to share, um, please feel free to, to send them to me. And um, I guess I can be the representative for the moment in terms of uh, talking as in, in part of that group. So it's a it's just an informal group um, looking to to make sure that we're we're doing the best that we can. Um, okay, with that, Bob, let me turn it over to you for uh, Tom Andrew. Thank you. Um, first, a quick comment for Ann. Um, that same night, the HRAC event is scheduled has an economic development summit and a financial forum. So town attend, oh, town employee attendance will be light. Um, and they're kind of one after the other. Um, on uh, the 13th of September, DPW staff sent a draft a DPW protocol policy covering tree safety issue located within uh, CONSCOM jurisdictional issues. Um, DPW worst worked with uh, Chuck Tyrone, our conservation administrator, to work on this set of protocols. As uh, soon as town council gives us some feedback, um, I'll let the board know. And, and that's, um, you know, that's the issue that you faced uh, up on Main Street in terms of a, uh, a homeowner having some trees taken down with, town, with CONSCOM's permission, uh, but at his expense. So stay tuned on that. We expect to hear back from, from town council. Uh, lastly, there's a few issues I can share one screen and dispense with. Um, here's a list of upcoming events. Um, the board has probably heard of all or most of these, but a press release will be going out either tonight or tomorrow, just a summary in one place. Um, on September 29th at six o'clock, there'll be a virtual Road 28, uh, Route 28 Road Diet uh, webinar. On September 30th, the next night, a Walker's Brook Drive corridor, uh, also Zoom meeting. That's primarily a neighborhood meeting, but that's also um, scheduled if the board is interested. And then lastly, on October 7th, the Economic Development uh, Summit's 5.30 to 7.30, and then the Financial Forum uh, to start at eight o'clock to follow. So that's, uh, that's all I have, thank you. Thanks, Bob. And to remind board members, um, tomorrow evening, the 23rd, 7 p.m. is a financial forum. And um, we are needed at that meeting. There is the matter of revolving funds that both FinCom and the select board uh, need to jointly vote on. So that's tomorrow evening at seven o'clock. Um, the, there is a Zoom invite. I, I, I didn't see one, but I went and I went onto the town website and um, the, there's a Zoom posted there that you're able to, to use for that meeting. Okay. Um, great. Okay. Any questions from the board? It is kind of funny. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, I would have expected we would re have received um, an invite to the financial forum, and I, I'm so glad you brought that up, Mark. Actually, one more is going out in the morning because I had to wait till the state clarified some things today. Um, they don't have a state budget or a timetable for having one is the bottom line. So we're kind of on our own. So just to clarify, did I miss it? Because to Karen's point, were we notified that that was coming? That there an email come through? Are we posted? Yes and yes. Um, there was a request that was put out to board members to confirm the 23rd because of the revolving fund issue. Uh, dates back a week or two, maybe? Yeah. Okay. I think so. But it posted? wasn't a formal invitation. There was a, an indication that was the date and to please confirm that we could attend so that we'd have a quorum. So I'm assuming that um, responded to that. 
Um, going forward, just um, for Mark, perhaps, and for Bob, um, if, if we can be formally notified once meetings are confirmed, that would be helpful. Yeah, I'm wondering, Bob, maybe we could ask Jackie to um, include us on the, the invitation list as it goes out. That would be great. That would be great. Thank you. And are we posted for the other two meetings that were mentioned? Or well, can we be posted in case a quorum decides to attend? Yeah, I think we, you are not posted yet. My intention is to post you for everything we showed you. Perfect. Thanks so much, Bob. Any other comments or questions? No. Okay. So let's move on to public comment. Um, I believe we have one person that wants to speak now. I think it's Eleanor. Yes. Hi, Eleanor. Oh, you are muted. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm watching you all online. Let me pause that. Uh, so thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak. So I'm Dr. Eleanor Shonkoff, 32 Harvard Street. Um, I wanted to start with an expression of gratitude. So this has been an unparalleled seven months and to the select board, to the town managers, to town staff, especially the health department uh, and to the members of the board of health. Thank you uh, for your fortitude and unyielding commitment to keeping our town safe. Um, I wanted to make public comment about the letter I submitted to the select board on September 16th. Um, for those of you who don't know, I was the chair of the board this past summer and had been on the board since November of 2018. Um, and I resigned in August of 2020. So a little over a month ago. And since that time, I've had space to reflect on my time there and wanted to speak directly. So in the letter, I highlighted some key roles for the town and Board of Health and listed some areas where I think improvement is warranted. These are retention, transparency, and functional support. So when we're not in a pandemic, there are more clear distinctions between the roles played by the board and the town, including management and staff. Um, and it's, I think it's admirable and correct that everyone jumped in at that time. I think it led to some blurred roles, which revealed some areas for improvement that already existed, but were magnified and those need to be addressed. So I think progress is actually already being made. Um, maybe an interim directive director could be put in place maybe before the next select board meeting. I don't know the progress there. Uh, it's my understanding that the Board of Health will conduct an internal assessment and also community needs assessment. I think these sound great for strategy moving forward. Um, I think we have more than enough information though to make progress on the, on the issues that I mentioned in the letter. So thank you, that concludes my comment. I appreciate the time. Thanks, Eleanor. Thanks for joining. Um, just to, to check, Caitlin, we don't have anyone else for public comment prior to the public hearing. Is that right? Oh, everyone else wanted to speak about parking. Okay, great. Um, so let, let's go to the public hearing. Um, with a little bit of effort, I think I can get this on screen. Carlo, could I ask you to read the legal notice, please? Okay. To the inhabitants of the town of Reading, please take notice that the select board of the town of Reading will hold a public hearing on September 22nd, 2020 at 7.30 p.m. remotely on Zoom to make modifications to the downtown parking system. A copy of the proposed documents regarding this topic will be in the select board packet on the town website, Reading readingma.gov. All interested parties are invited to attend the hearing. I may submit their comments in writing or by email prior to 4 p.m. on September 22nd, 2020 to town manager at ci.reading.ma.us uh, by order of Bob Lillishore, town manager. Thanks, Carlo. Um, so with the, with the hearing open, um, what I'd like to suggest is that um, Julie offered to share her screen and go through kind of the highlights of the presentation just so that everyone can participate or hear that first. Um, 
then what we would do is open to uh, public comments. Um, we have six, I believe, people roughly that have asked to speak um, and to be able to allow them to uh, to share their, their comments um, with the board. Mm -hmm. We have with us, um, so quite a few people. <laughs> so I see, so Julie, Jean, and, and Aaron uh, from the town side. Um, if I get the name right, is it, is it Matt Smith? Great, great. Um, from Nelson Nygaard, uh, the group that did the uh, one of the studies of the parking assessment. Um, uh, from the police department, I see Christina Amendola and I think Dave Clark. Yep, see you both. Thank you. Thanks for joining this evening. And also um, Jane Wellman, uh, Officer Mike Scouten. Um, oh, and we also have um, from DPW, Jane Kinsella, Chris Cole. Great. So full house. Awesome. Um, so Julie, can I turn it over to you to uh, go through the uh, presentation, please? Yes, thank Stop you. Sharing. Sorry, I'm getting mine off here. No problem. There you go. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for having me back. Um, it's the big night, hopefully, for us um, on the town side. So what I'm going to do tonight, as Mark mentioned, is just kind of go through the presentation that I've updated um, over the past couple weeks. Um, but it is, um, or it's been an iterative process. So um, let me see, Let's share my screen really quickly. Um, find my presentation. Where did it go? All right, let me see. So, um, you know, we're here tonight to talk about the potential system modifications that we've been discussing since actually last October. And on this slide, you know, I do note that we did discuss this in January, and then I updated the same presentation um, in February, also for March, the meeting didn't happen, and then again for August and for September. So um, the information that's in this presentation hasn't changed in any huge ways. It's, it's been really continuous since we first started talking about this. There have been some modifications that we've made to small aspects of, of things that we've been thinking as we've gone along though and app, as we've taken into consideration the feedback that we've heard um, from residents and businesses and stakeholders. So, um, as I mentioned in the past, you know, while in the face of the, this effort, it really is, you know, a cross disciplinary team effort. The parking traffic transportation task force the staff group includes, you know, members from management, Bob and Jean, planning and economic development staff, um, and Aaron's here tonight too. Um, DPW and engineering who are with us tonight, and then members of public safety, so both the police department and the fire department. Um, we felt that it was very important that we be united with these recommendations so we're not working at cross purposes to each other and um, you know we've had a dialogue that's been on a weekly basis basically um, starting last fall and then you know throughout um, the latter part of the summer we so we're constantly talking about what it is we're proposing and new information that we've heard and whether we need to think about things um, in a different way and, and you know it's been a really great team effort and I'm really proud to be able to be the face of this effort and present it to you um, over the past year. So again, um, going through the sources that we've used for this presentation. So the maps and the data that you see, um, they many of them come um, from the um, parking study that we had done in 2008, which was also revised in 2018, prepared by Nelson Nygaard. And as Mark mentioned, uh, Matt Smith from Nelson Nygaard is here with us tonight to help answer any questions that you and the public may have. Um, and then we did a survey last fall um, to kind of understand the parking needs of the town and needs and challenges. Um, anecdotal information, you know, you all know we hear about parking at every public meeting that we have, it's a hot topic. Um, and then ob obviously our ongoing conversations with the police department, they, they see things and know things from a different um, side than, than most of us experience. So their, their input's really helpful. Um, and the philosophy and opportunities that are, you know, underpinning this effort are, they're based on industry practice and recommendations from the Nelson Nygaard study. They're not things that we dreamed up overnight, though we would love to take credit for them. Um, so tonight's presentation, um, I have a brief overview of the proposal. Um, I know, you know, a lot of you have, have been with this this whole time and have, you know, seen how it's evolved over time. And I just really want to say for anyone who's new to this and wants to go back and see what's been discussed. Everything is also on the website and I'm just going to quickly flip screens. Um, so 
under the planning division on the town website, there's a link on the left hand side to downtown parking system modifications. And there's a brief description at the top. And then if you scroll down, there are links to all the prior select board discussions of this going back to last October, um, as well as the presentations. And then additional information that I provided to the select board was also within their packets for each of these meetings and can be searchable and findable that way. So I'm just going to go back to where I was. All right. Um, and then I'm going to go over the outreach efforts that we recently undertook and some of the feedback that we received. Um, I did get a lot of new emails in the last couple of days and tried to read through them all. I didn't get a chance to respond to everybody, but there was, you know, again, a lot of really good valid input that came through just, just recently. Um, and many of what, much of which we'd heard before, but you know, some new ideas as well. Um, the request of the parking traffic transportation task force for tonight is that you vote on these changes that we've been discussing for almost a year. Um, we think they're really well-founded and logical and, um, you know, could help us go in a new direction um, and, you know, I think it's important for me to note that I would love it if we could please all the people all the time and make everybody happy. Um, but, you know, I think we, we still will get complaints, even if we do implement some changes. Um, and then again, we will just continue to reassess and, and see if we need to make tweaks or make additional changes as we move forward. So the items that I'd like you to vote on, uh, specifically into four categories are broken down into the least space program, the employee permit program, public access, and then kiosks and public lots. And then at the end of the presentation, I did provide some supporting documentation, which we can get into if you have questions. Um, I, I probably won't present it unless you want me to, um, but the implementation timeline, kind of what we're thinking about when we might be able to implement certain aspects of the program um, and, um, you know, um, some of the aspects might be more short term and some might be more long term, but it's all in that. And then I did provide the engineering field inventory of parking spaces, which differs slightly from the numbers that you see on all the maps I use, which were put together by our consultant. Um, so this is in uh, when I had I asked engineering to go out and kind of um, give a conservative estimate of what they really thought we could achieve if we formalize parking on certain streets. Um, looking at you know fire safety access um the, the idea that people don't always park in the most efficient manner so giving lots of room looking at all the driveways and the curb cuts and, and different things like that so hope we think that that's a realistic estimate um and then i provided the um police dpw lighting needs assessment they went out and kind of evaluated where we might need to make some um, improvements to lighting and safety upgrades and a, the Harnden Yard lot proposal, which came through from the police department and explains what we would do with uh, the leased parking in the Harnden Yard lot um, if you do away with the lease, leasing program. And then again, a map of downtown geography. So for anyone who isn't quite totally familiar with the lingo that I'm using, um, it's, a, it's described maybe in a little more simple way at the end of the presentation. So I'm gonna just go over what we talked about. I'm gonna zoom in on this map because I'm gonna talk the text um, so don't worry too much about the words, <laughs> just look at the, the map. Um, so what I did here, it's a little bit revised from, I think the last time I showed it to you, because we did decide a few weeks ago as, as a group that we would take the proposed modifications to the resident only areas off the table at this time. So, um, when you're looking at this map, the, the solid color lines like this fuchsia, lines here and the green and the gray, those are our existing parking regulations, which are all described over here on the left-hand side. Um, any of the, the areas that we're proposing to make changes I've highlighted and, and I use two different colors. I use pink and I use orange. And the orange changes are within this area that we're referring to as the inner core. And then the pink changes are in this area that we're referring to as the outer core. So I really just highlighted street segments that were where proposed changes are at this time. And again, no changes to the resident only areas um, here on Green Street, Linden Street, Bancroft, Chute, um, and down here on High Street. So um, that by extension will hopefully re um, not result in any changes to commuter parking supply. So just really quickly to go over the changes in the inner core. Um, the first thing that we're looking at doing is actually 
um, adding regulations to Ash Street. There are parking spaces there that are striped, um, but there aren't any regulations. And we see that as an area where we could add public two hour spaces. Um, and the reason for public two hour is because we're proposing that within the inner core, as much as possible, we would like it to be public two hour. Um, so right now where we have the green highlight, or sorry, the green, that, that all indicates existing public two hour and we're trying to make the system more uniform and more simple for the user by having consistent regulations um, in a, from block to block as much as we can. Another change is that we would take, we would move a few of the employee, um, the employee spaces. So here on Gould Street, this like black dotted area. And then here on green, there's maybe one or two spaces. And then in Brandy Court, there are I think 12 employee spaces. So those spaces would also just become public two hour and they would not be available to employees. We do have a proposal to increase the amount of employee parking or the locations for employee parking in the outer core, which I'll talk, talk about in a minute. Um, and then the lots are highlighted because that's where we're proposing to add the um, paid parking kiosks. So um, just really quick, we're looking at two kiosks in each of our public lots here. So the Brandy Court lot and the Upper Haven lot um, and the kiosks, um, the goal of the kiosks is, you know, to provide, um, we, we would provide, they would, they would be <laughs> able to be accessed by smartphone or you could go up to it and program it. You could pay with a credit card cash coins. Um, they would be located in, you know, visible, well-lit, safe locations. Um, there are a lot of details that we're kind of talking through about the kiosks, but that's the basic gist. And then um, the idea is that there would be, it would be kind of a pricing scheme so that people who want to park in downtown all day long um, won't take up valuable spaces in the lots. We see the parking lots really as an amenity um, and, and we would like to encourage a certain amount of turnover in the lots um, and not have, you know, employees of businesses necessarily parking there all day. So we can get a little bit more into detail about the kiosks um, later. And then um, I mentioned um, that the leasing program that we talked about. So the, in terms of where the lease spaces are, we have four that are in this Brandy Court lot. Um, and sorry, they're not in Brandy Court lot, they're on Brandy Court. And that's something I should clarify because I, I misunderstood that until recently. Um, so those spaces would turn into public two hour spaces. So those are the changes proposed for the inner core. And then to the, in the outer core, um, the pink highlights are the locations where we would make changes and the outer core is where we're really looking to do public two hour or all day with employee permit. So um, as you know, like there are already a lot of employee parking spaces like in the outer core. So employees are already used to parking in these areas and we would just extend them. So like this area here on Haven Street, instead of just public two hour, it would be public two hour or all day with employee permit. Um, again, similarly on Chapin, Green Street is currently unregulated and we would look to add employee parking along the north side of Green Street. Um, and then up here in the northern part, this northern stretch of Sanborn Street um, would also be public two hour or all day with employee permit, similarly on Linden Street. One thing that I would wanna point out um, to anyone who's watching and to some, for anyone who didn't um, fully appreciate this um, earlier, on some of these streets that are quite narrow, if we do formalized parking, it will only be on one side. Um, and for proper fire and emergency access, it would mean the other side would then become no, no parking. Um, so that's just something I wanted to clarify in case it wasn't obvious from prior conversations. Um, and then again, in the outer core, like we do have 41 of our 50 lease parking spaces are located right here along High Street. Um, and these would turn into public two hour or all day with employee permit. The other 13 lease spaces are in the Harnden Yard lot over here. And I have a map that I can provide if anyone wants to see what that would look like. But the police department came up with what I think is a logical way of using those spaces. So that I think covers that. And I have it in chart format. Um, for anyone who just wants to read about it. Uh, I have the geographies kind of described up here and then impacts to the system and to each user type and component described below. 
um, just basically what I just said. One thing is that we did kind of fine tune what we're thinking with the employee permit program over the last couple of weeks. Um, and the police department felt pretty strongly that um, in order to um, be able to maintain some supply of employee permits throughout, throughout the year and not have them all get taken um, in the first month, that we would want to put a cap of five for the first month per business. Um, those first five would be free. And then we then after that first month, they would charge $20 a month or um, $240 a year for up to 10 additional permits per business on a case by case basis. Um, so that that's language that we work together to kind of work out in the last couple of weeks. And I should have mentioned when I was, was when I was on the map that we do think Sorry, we do think we can add about 180 uh, formal locations for employees to park within that outer core area, which would enable the police department to give out a lot more permits. Okay, and then this next slide is just the, um, the footnotes from the prior slide if you want more detail. And then, just, so the outreach and feedback that we, um, the staff have done. So we did a lot like prior to COVID. And then when we reconvened um, this effort last month, um, we did a lot over Zoom. So um, we had, we've had a couple of meetings with PDA Dental specifically. We, um, let me just back up for a minute, sorry. So for this outreach effort, um, we did, um, put a notification in the water bill that went to, you know, anyone in town who gets a water bill. And then we um, did a code red um, alert to a wide area around the downtown, including about, I think, 3,400 um, different, um, different contacts. Um, I did also send out a few emails um, to over 190 businesses in the downtown, um, to a, a few dozen residents, um, a lot of all the property owners that I have contact information for. Um, so we, we did as much outreach as we could and we offered 10 different um, Zoom sessions at different times of day. Um, I tried to like vary it as much as I possibly could to capture as many people in different schedules as possible. The info sessions that we have attended by um, about a handful of people each time, which actually made for some really good like small group conversations and it enabled people who did participate to ask me a lot of really in-depth questions. And um, I thought they were generally speaking very positive. We had a lot of really great feedback um, and actually um, it, I, based on some of the sessions that we had in August, I mean, and the feedback we got from residents in August, we actually made some of the changes that, um, the change to, we just, we made the decision not to make any changes to the resident only areas at this time. So we did really take the feedback like seriously. And I felt like the conversations were quite positive. I have summarized um, some of the feedback on the next two slides. Um, so generally speaking, resident concerns that I heard in the Zoom sessions were, um, you know, that the town, the downtown's getting built really quickly. And there's, if we don't have a parking supply issue now, we will have a parking supply issue in the future. Um, and then safety issues with lighting, sidewalks, and plowing need to be addressed. Um, and generally, there's a general feeling that we don't have enough commuter parking downtown. Um, there were a lot of other comments. There was a lot of relief that we decided not to change resident only areas. Um, more recently, there's been uh, feedback I've gotten over email um, asking for clarification about um, the streets that are narrow, like I said, where we would formalize parking and then on one side only and then have the other side be no parking. Um, and then, you know, concerns about um, if we allow employees to park a little bit further out, that'll push commuters out and, and then it's just gonna be growing. Um, so there's been a variety of, of comments and concerns. Business feedback. Um, there's been some questions about whether we would treat Brandy Court, the Brandy Court lots the same way as the Upper Haven lot um, and that 30 minutes free may not be enough time in the Brandy Court lot um, for the medical uses that are down there and because appointments tend to be um, longer, especially now during COVID when you need to arrive early. And, and let them know you're there. And, and so it takes a little bit more time. Um, the importance of allowing validation and flexibility around how we do that um, was, was mentioned a lot. 
um, the kiosks and challenges for elderly patrons um, can't be taken lightly. And then, you know, something that we have been hearing throughout this conversation um, is that, you know, if we charge for parking in the downtown, people will take their business elsewhere. Um, and then again, safety issues with lighting, sidewalks, and plowing. And those are things we're having like ongoing conversations with the police department and, and DPW about. Um, and as I mentioned, I did provide that, um, that chart at the end of this presentation that kind of describes where we might be able to make some upgrades in that regard. So those were the, the key points that I heard in the Zoom sessions. And then again, what we're asking or requesting of you tonight. Um, the, the, these are the voting components. And do you want me to keep going, Mark? Um, I, I wonder if it, it's, um, so these are more specific to the votes. I'm wondering if it's worth taking a, a, a break here, um, allowing for public input uh, and the public hearing to take place. I'd ask just for one uh, quick clarification before going to that. Um, where there is new outer core parking being designated for employees, what is the impact on residents? What, what access do they have? Sure, let me just go back to the map really quick. Um, that's a really good question. I'll zoom back in. Um, so we do have currently on the books a system whereby any resident with an employee restriction of, along their property frontage can apply to the police department for an employee permit so that they can park there. I don't believe to date that it's heavily utilized. Um, I, and I, I'm not sure that I think members of the police department can describe a little bit more about how that works um, and whether there's discretion used um, in issuing those permits. Uh, yeah, Julie, they are free if, you if your house is um, regulated on a regulated street, you get a free pass for whatever goes in front of your house to use. Great, thank you. Um, if, oh, Anne, I see you talking, but I don't hear you. Um, would that be the, would that remain the same? Okay. Yes, that is not proposed to change at this time. Okay. So for the, for areas that are, would now become employee permit or uh, two hour parking. If you live on that street, you can park in front of your house for free all day. Yes, you can get a that. permit from the police department. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Mark, I have a question. That, um, a question uh, or a clarification? Uh, a request, a, a clarification on this point. Okay. Thank you. Uh, which is um, the permits right now are stickers that go on your car. So if you live on one of these streets and you have a guest or a care provider, um, are they unable to park on the street? Are exception, you know, in cities they have guest passes, but I, I haven't seen that here in town. I'm not recommending that. I'm just curious about where guests park. So I would have to defer to the police department on exactly how the employee permits are tied or whether they're tied to specific license plates or not. But I do believe they're, the employee permits are hang tags and that would be the permit that a resident would get if they live on a street where there's an employee restriction along their property frontage. It's a little confusing, but. Thank you. Sure. And sorry, I see you sorry. trying again. There you so go. It's not, a, it's not a sticker. It's something that could be transferred from one car to another. That's my understanding, yes. Yep. I see the, an Amandola nodding, yes. Okay. Great. Yeah, sorry. The employee one's a hanging placard, yep. Um, and can, how, how many um, could be provided per household? Uh, we usually do how many cars are registered to the house. Okay, thank you. Can I suggest, folks, let's move to accepting. Um, public discussion, uh, let those folks ask questions. Once we've done that, had some of the questions answered, uh, we can close the public hearing and then the board um, can ask many more specific questions you know, before we move on to the discussion of a vote. So I'm seeing heads nodding. So let's, let's, let's move forward with that. Um, Caitlin, who do we, do we have? Do we wanna let folks in? Yep, um, uh, we'll start with uh, Lisa Egan first. Great.
Lisa, I think you're you're if you're listed as Brendan Egan, then then we have the right person. Lisa, are you there? We're not hearing you. You're on mute. Thank you. That's it's now it's Lisa. We still have you on mute though. There you go. Thank you. I'm just trying to start the video. Sorry, I just got let in. I apologize for that. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for all the careful thought that has gone into all the parking preparation. Oh, I should have turned down your the whatever your broadcast is in the background, please. We're not hearing you. You're on mute. I am. No, I'm not. Hi, can you guys can everyone hear me now? Oh, okay. I, I hear myself in the background yeah, speaking. Sorry, I, just got let in. I apologize for that. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for all the careful thought that has gone into all the parking preparation. Lisa, is that, do you have the, the broadcast running on RCTV or YouTube or Facebook? Yes, I need to shut down my other window. Apologies. Let me just do that. I've not Thanks. done it in this way before. Okay, I think I fixed my technical difficulties. Please, I think you're all set. Okay, sorry. This isn't my first Zoom, but it felt like it for a second there. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to say thanks very much for all the, the preparation. I know this has been like a year of meetings and a lot of discussions around um, parking and all the diff different details and recommendations. I think it's very challenging right now to make a change with the impact of the pandemic on our local businesses. Um, I do know that there are, but you know, the holiday season is really important. The number one employer in the country and in, in the state is restaurants. I feel like making it more difficult to shop locally and in Reading, um, it's a perceived hindrance, even if the first 30 minutes is free. I just am concerned that it will be another challenge for our shopkeepers. Um, and with so many services, retail and restaurants struggling um, to do it now seems, um, I, I just worry that it's gonna be caught, become a big problem. I think the timing is difficult. I know that um, the state road diet has been postponed until spring because they don't feel like it's a, a good time to make such a change or study, you know, the economic climate and parking and um, such. So I just wanted to say, I think if the state is holding off on making big decisions to our roadways, which kind of ties in with this, perhaps we should follow suit. I hate to kick the can because I know it's been a lot of meetings already, but I just really feel like with everything that our businesses are dealing with and all of the the feedback that we've gotten either um, via email or Facebook, that it might not be the most advantageous time. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lisa. Can I ask Lisa a question? Please. Uh, I was wondering, Lisa, are you are you viewing all of the recommendations this way, or um, just the kiosks, or the or the package um, as something that should be um, deferred? Thank you. I mean, from my perspective, I think the perceived um, challenges with the paid parking is what jumps out to me and that I've received the most feedback on when I'm out and about talking to businesses or residents. Um, when I think of places where the MAPC study that Reading did a few years ago pointed to where a lot of people in Reading shop, places that come to mind are Woburn, Linfield, um, Wakefield, Burlington, and to the best of my knowledge, none of them have paid parking. And I know change is hard, but I am worried about being the first when it will just be something that might deter people, even if it's a tiny amount, even 10 cents an hour, it's more the, the perceived hassle than it is the actual money. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Julie, quick question just on, on following up on that. Um, what is the, the, we didn't let you put up the timeline discussion at all, but it, as it relates to paid parking, the recommendation, what would be the implementation timing of that? 
Let me just pull up the timeline. That's a really good question. I was thinking, oh, maybe I could show that. Um, so, uh, sorry, it's really far down here. Okay, here it is. Um, and it's two different timelines you'll see. And hopefully it's not too small, but um, let me see if I can make it bigger. All right, so um, basically, if you were to vote tonight, there are certain things we could start working on tomorrow. We actually have a staff meeting already scheduled for tomorrow um, to, to see whether we're, whether we need to make any, uh, start working on this, right? So certain things can be done sooner. So police department, they order signs or, or sorry, permits every year. So that's something they already know how to do and we just figure out uh, exactly what we're talking about. Um, and that could be maybe implemented for January. Um, again, with like any sort of street signs that are needed for the downtown areas based on any regulation changes you vote on tonight, like that's something the DPW is fam familiar with doing and could do pretty quickly. Um, I don't wanna say pretty quickly, maybe for January, right? Um, kiosks, we were never thinking about doing those in the fall. Um, there's a lot more work to be done. We have to do vetting of the different vendors. We wanted to really um, interview other towns and see what their challenges have been. I've do started doing it, I've done it with a couple towns, but I would really wanna like understand more. We'd need to like look into parking app vendors. Um, we'd need to figure out exact locations for them. Um, and then um, what, what the funding source is gonna be um, delivering installation will take time and that's not something we would do in the winter so you know we'd really be thinking of actually putting the kiosks in maybe in the spring or the summer of next year so. thanks julie yeah. great all right mark Thank mark, you, I have, mark i have one quick question sorry oh please you know quickly julie is this a presentation on the kiosk specifically for both lots? The proposal is to put them in both the Brandy Court lot and the CBS lot. Okay, thank you. Great. All right, thanks, Lisa. Who, um, Caitlin, who do we have uh, next to join? Um, next, we have Dave Talbot. Dave Talbot. Hi, Dave. Are you there? Okay. Hi. Yeah. Can you see me? No, but we can hear you. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you. And I, I lost the thread there for a second. Um, so I missed the last minute or two, but thanks for your efforts and, and the participation um, of, of the public now in the process. I wanted to ask if I could just have maybe four minutes because there's a, a neighbor that I wanted to speak for. Um, I want to highlight for you the fact that Linden Street between, uh, by the way, for, for the record, Dave Talbot, 75 Linden Street. Uh, Linden Street between Woburn and Lowell is a residential street, unlike some of those other ones you mentioned, Chapin or uh, whether it was Gould or Green uh, down, which are in the business zone. Um, you know, we're an all residential street. You know, we're willing to, to, to take our share. What's been proposed here isn't just um, the employee regime where a, a resident can get a sticker. Most significantly, uh, the proposal, which nobody understood until this weekend, was that the entire left side of the street would be made no parking. It's been parking on both sides for, for 50 years. And I know that because I will now speak for one of my neighbors, if I may, Jean Thompson, who lives at 48 Linden Street on the left side, I went down on Sunday when I first heard about this from my neighbor um, and her side is gonna be made no parking. Jean is 86 years old. She lives alone. She'd never heard anything about this. There really wasn't outreach and I'm sort of surprised about, I heard some comments made about e emails being sent to neighbors. This did not happen. Um, the people most affected are the people on the left side of Linden Street this is nine houses with about 15 residential units that have been parking there. I asked um, Jean what she thought. She said she's against it. She'd never heard anything about it. Uh, again, she's lived there for 50 years. She's 86 years old. I, I really think you know, we need to take a, a, a second look at the Linden Street piece and really recognize how incredibly disruptive this is to the street. Um, and so, 
and I understand what, what Julie said about the safety, um, but the informal arrangement is fine. And many, many streets are of a similar narrowness and have parking on both sides, you know, all over the downtown. We can, we can get into that at another meeting. Um, what I would ask, and I think there's others queued up is really, uh, there was a notification that the burden on Linden Street is, is really major here to take parking away from the entire left side of the street you have a better solution, which, and it, all, all you're gonna do is push cars into all these other streets. You look to the left of the pink uh, highlighted Linden Street. These are all similar streets to ours. Kingston, Bancroft, Mount Vernon, School, Dudley, uh, you know, High, they're all in the same situation as us. They have no regulation whatsoever. So when you do this on one street, you're pushing, uh, you're making problems on the one street and then you're gonna push all these extra capacity if you do this on these other streets and you're gonna hear from those people. And you know it doesn't solve anything. Um, I think you should leave it informal. And, and if you rethink this, that this whole area that I'm talking about between Woburn and Middlesex, I think we could all, I would get behind and I think many of my neighbors would in the greater good of the town to help the employee parking situation. We could have this mix of employee uh, permitting and resident permitting in this entire district. And there'd be lots of capacity there. The second benefit of that is one that hasn't come up yet, which is there are many people who drive into this, these neighborhoods from out of town in order to go to the Reading train station and get the express train and a, a cheaper fare. They park all over these streets. Linden is one, but not the only one. You have a lot of capacity there being used by people that use the neighborhoods for this purpose. If you were to impose this kind of permit regime throughout the neighborhood, you would get rid of all of those, um, what the, would the word be, squatters or uh, sort of dead parkers who, who you'd, you'd get rid of them because they couldn't do that anymore. You would create lots of capacity. And I think that you know, that would also get buy-in from all these streets and people would appreciate that. We'd make lots of room for the employee spaces that are so badly needed and that I hope we can find. And then you're not gonna just sort of really drop the hammer on one street and do nothing on all the others. So um, that's the gist of what I wanna say. I, 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 it's, it's been late news. I'm someone who's fairly involved in town. This was late news to me and to everybody else on my street about the, about the no parking on the opposite side. And I think maybe even there's some people in this room who didn't know that either. Um, so anyway, I think I've made my point. I'm probably over speaking. To get back to Gene Thompson, who's lived there for 50 years, I think we can do better about notifying people when major changes like this are proposed for in front of their house. Um, and I'd leave it there, happy to follow up if anybody has a question back for me or to continue participating. But I do hope you, you withhold this and do not impose this on Linden Street. Instead, leave it informal. Let's come up with a permit regime for the wider neighborhood, a bigger, better solution that's not gonna cause problems for all of you and all of these other streets down, down the road. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Dave. All right, who, um, who is, is next? We have Bernie Horn next. Great. Hi, Bernie. Good evening. Can you uh, hear and see me? Yes. Great. Uh, don't know if I can share a screen. I cannot share a screen. Um, uh, first of all, well, so let me just get down to the uh, points here. I just have two questions for the board. First, I have sent some email I, I sent in, in response to a request for me to more fully detail the outline that I um, submitted, uh, was asked to provide more detail, and I will take that as read. However, that's a bit unfair for me to assume because I just sent it at five o'clock. And uh, so I'm, maybe the board could just give me a sense for whether they have been able to read my thing. I would ha be happy to share it with everybody on the screen if I can do so, um, if not. But anybody, has, has anybody not read it or? So I have not seen it. Okay, so let me, me start. Me... I saw it and I did read it. Thanks. 
second question is just, I know I'm gonna make a lot of, I'm gonna make some quick references to the Nelson Nygaard report. Um, I just wanna make sure that we understand the full extent of the data set that was used to base the utilization ratios and so forth on. I'm just wondering if the board could just relay what their understanding was as far as the extent of the data set that was used in terms of the seasonality, the, uh, you know, the difference in days, time of, time of year that that study was based on and, and, and the, many, the many documents that were shared with respect to that. Now, not Mark, because I know he knows the answer to this. <laughs> Maybe Ann or, 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 or Vanessa, uh, Carlo, give me a sense for what you know to be the data set for the Nelson Nygaard utilization uh, data. With respect to the season? Yeah, like how many, like the, how, how extensive is the data set and so forth? I don't think that data was ever, that level of depth was provided. Yeah, it was in the, it was in the, okay. and again, I'll, well, let me just point out that, you know, the study was based on one day of data uh, on the, uh, and that's on page one of the 20, uh, you know, the 2018 report. So in other words, all the utilization ratios that you're seeing, and I see them here on the screen, that's only one day. Um, and so when I, st when I started to try to understand why my experience was not consistent with the actual data in this report, uh, then I understood that this report that you're basing the decision on is only one day. It doesn't address the issues of, you know, seasonality in the winter. More people need to do that. I mean, I ride my bike off. Facebook Live, the link from RCTV and YouTube for public comment. We'll be allocating uh, time and I think you may have uh, either Facebook or YouTube open in the background. Are you talking to me, Mark? Yeah, I think um, what we're finding is that the delay of the broadcast it, it, it comes through for some people. I don't know. Is it is it you or? Um, hey, Talbot, can I have you mute, please? That that may be part of it also. Everyone should be on mute other than the speaker. Actually, Caitlin, can you put Dave on mute? Thank you. OK, let's try that again. Um, right, just a, a quick question on, on, on timing. Um, I know that you had uh, quite a bit of information you were hoping to share. Um, we've... I'll, be, I'll be brief. OK, great. Thank you. And, and I appreciate Lisa and, and, the, and the former and the prior speaker, you know, were very efficient in their time. And I will be too. So yeah, so look, my point is simply to say that the, the, the experience that actual users have is very different than what appears to be the recommendations are being based on. And I, and I know there's been a tremendous amount of work done on this. And judging from all the many people that I've talked to about it, there's clearly a whole lot of different opinions. Um, let me just point out that I think that the Nelson Nygaard report does mention the fact that we are we have a very, very complex and way more complex set of regulations that that uh, probably should be simplified. And that, in my opinion, that could clearly help. Uh, Wakefield, Stoneham, Melrose, Reading, North, uh, Andover, North Reading have one, maybe two. So my recommendation would be to substantially reduce the number of parking categories and regulations ideally to two, uh, but a maximum of three to four. And this simplification, I think, will solve a great deal of problems. The other issue is that I think that uh, to reduce the Reading resident only spaces and reduce the, the, the pricing on that from 150 plus uh, per household to back to the 25 plus $10 for an additional car at each resident. I think this would help to solve a lot of the problems. I know that uh, I, I am one of those uh, so-called squatters that needs to park outside because I don't have the resident sticker. I know I'm a resident of Reading, but I'm not considered a resident for parking purposes. Um, so that's the other issue. And, and I think that if we were to eliminate some of these other categories like the employee parking, to the degree that we liberalize a lot more of the spaces, I think that would solve a great deal of the problems. I think you've seen just in the final throes of trying to make a decision here, you've already got a, a lot of questions from just two people, including Vanessa, who had a very important question about what, what do you do? So the more regulations and complexity you add to the system, 
the more difficult it is to navigate and the more difficult it is for people to try to navigate the system. Um, so again, short term, uh, medium term, I think that would be the short term recommendations. The medium term, I would put as 12 to 18 months uh, after the, the complexity has been reduced. Um, and then the natural supply and demand balance would start to be understood in a post COVID world. And I think that this is very important to try to do because the, the, the high parking for resident only, the, the, that charge, I can't emphasize to the select board enough that this is a very divisive um, way to, to split our town. And I know a lot of the people in the select board have been very vocal about trying, you know, why is Reading so divided? Why do we have these factions? Um, you know, it's great to talk about that but when policy actually divides the people, you know, you heard that now I'm a squatter in the minds of somebody else, when all I'm trying to do is get to work. Um, and if I don't pay up, uh, you know, while well, somebody else doesn't have to pay up to get to work, you know, it creates a problem when we're trying to look for people to support things like two and a half overrides. So I think that this is a real issue. You know, I, I, I've been 40 years in the investment business. You know, I understand the issue of market economics. I understand the the, the pricing discipline and what that does. I'm also a founding member of the MIT Center for Finance and Policy. And I realize that there's a point where public policy and market economics don't always equal one another. And so that's, I, I guess what I'm trying to do is, is lobby for a much more, you know, kind of equal footing among our residents to try to bring people together uh, to some degree. I won't cover I mean, I the to, unintended I consequences yeah, I need I, to wrap you here. We're, we're running well. I won't, I won't um, deal with the unintended consequences. I think Lisa has, has um, done that. But I will say that, you know, a, a kiosk and, and the resident fees as they are, are very regressive, especially to low income people and to the newer, younger residents that presumably we're trying to attract because younger residents will support our schools more than older residents who can afford to pay it. So again, that's the point. The other uh, thing is that the feedback um, I'd give is that the, you know, I've tried my best to, to do my homework and I'd like to propose to the board that the parking, you know, uh, traffic and uh, traffic and, and parking commission include six residents uh, of different um, uh, backgrounds and, and uses, business, commuting, uh, uh, and so forth workers and so forth. Uh, my view is that the, the that you're not getting the right feedback, that it's somewhat being filtered, and that these you the actual users of the system don't have any real voice in terms of what's what's being proposed. And, Ernie, I need to stop you there. We're, I've got a few other people who are uh, on bedtime sure, with kids. Thanks. <laughs> yep. No, I didn't think I used much more time than the other people, but let's right. you're, you're at about 10 minutes right now, Brian. Any been, question I've... for me? Thank you, Bernie. I did just want to correct myself. Um, the information, um, the data you had questioned um, was in fact in one of the previous presentations from Nygaard. Say that again. I had stated that the, I had stated that the um, data was not present in some of the earlier presentations, but it is in fact in an earlier one from, I believe this year. The data on, um... When they, the data on parking and and when it was taken, uh, et cetera. Um, I can also clarify that some of the the um, utilization information that I showed in a prior presentation is not all of the utilization information that we got. Um, the Nelson Nygaard study actually went out on a couple different days, um, and that it's it's. I, I believe I pointed Bernie to the correct presentation. Um, from Nelson Nagard, but it does show that there was data on Thursday. and on a Thursday. Yeah. yeah, it was a Wednesday and a Thursday, but it, it, it encompassed basically basically one day. So when you're trying to analyze data, you're looking for means, means, maximums, the number of data points and so forth. But when you have a sample size of virtually one day, it really isn't the way to make good public policy decisions. That's all I'm trying to point out. Um, so the other thing that I think I would point out is on the Nelson Nygaard study, they recommend against uh, putting in kiosks. 
but that's only what they suggest to be a very long-term solution after we've reduced dramatically the complexity of the system and then seeing what the fallout of that, where the natural supply and demand actually balance out. So uh, I would think that to the degree that you vote for kiosks, that would be against the Nelson Nygaard report that as I've read it. So thanks, thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks. Any other questions thanks, for me? Thank you, Bernie. Thank you for all the input and research and, uh, you know, we provided tonight was very helpful. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Can I ask, um, I had a request from a resident who needs to put her kids to bed, um, Brooke Secreta. Is she um, on the list and it might be possible to let her in? Um, she is, yes. Could we accommodate the children here? Um, just one comment in the background, just I know um, I got a note from um, from Dave Talbot, just that um, the the comment he was uh, bringing up about people who aren't don't have uh, commuter stickers. He's talking about out of town residents that are coming to Reading and then parking on the streets to use the commuter rail. Hi, Brooke. Hi there. How are you? Thank you. If, I, if you chose me over someone else, I appreciate it as I'm sure my neighbors do as they start hearing my kids screaming because it's bedtime, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I apologize, I, I was trying to follow along online and it got to a certain point where it was, just became the spinning wheel of death, so I probably have maybe a little bit less of the information than I should. Um, my family and I are residents of 76 Linden Street, so we're in that outer core, the pink highlighted section of your map, um, and we're located at the top of the hill um, in the residential section of the street, really between Woburn and Lowell. And so I wanted to speak today just to bring up some serious concerns around the upcoming vote with parking, specifically that um, we had no knowledge of any of these true changes to our street in particular until quite honestly yesterday. Um, I did hear that there was some notifications and things that went out, but um, if I'm really honest, you know, as you all know, we are in the middle of a pandemic and as a very young family, I am inundated with information around school and Zooms and school openings and virtual learning. And I feel like anything about these parking changes, if it did come our way, has been very difficult to find, pushed to the bottom of the pile, kind of buried beneath some of these real COVID concerns. And so until yesterday, I really had none of this information um, to really think through. And so my main goal tonight is to ask you guys for a delay in the vote or, or no um, for right now, but I did want to kind of air some of my concerns tonight. Um, the first one being that when one of the things that was talked about with that pink outer core is that it would be employee all day parking, um, which essentially would leave me no parking at all to park in front of my own home. Now I did hear there's potentially a sticker that I could get. Um, that's what the last thing I heard really before that it went out on Facebook for me, but it doesn't address the fact that as again, a parent with two small kids and two people trying to work from home, school's not open. I am relying on carpools, elderly parents, um, family members, all these different people as a village to help us through this problem. And when you start eliminating parking for them, there's nowhere for them to go. Um, and it's just, you know, to not be able to park in front of my own door to carry in groceries um, or to have my elderly parents come and help watch out the kids or a tutor or a teacher or a care provider becomes exceptionally difficult. Um, and it's not something I think that's really been well thought through when it comes to guest parking. Um, additionally, when you think about the outer core proposal, there's no businesses on our block at all. Um, this is a residential part of Linden Street. Um, and it's just pushing everything into our neighborhood and then continually moving out. And it's not taking into account the entire neighborhood as a whole from Middlesex to you know, Woburn, that whole neighborhood, all of those streets are being ignored and it's just our street that's really being looked at. And I guess I'm concerned as to why they haven't looked at ways to maybe do small sections of employee parking across five or six streets versus an entire street of residents no longer being able to have residential parking on their street with guests and the ability for 
you know, someone to drop, to come by and drop my kid off from ballet class while I'm working full time. So um, I really think there's not a lot of thought through that part of it that's concerning to me. We have a lot of elderly neighbors on our street um, who absolutely are not going to be able to walk up and down a hill if they have to park at the top of the hill and walk down, particularly in the winter. Um, and then beyond the, the issue really of notification, um, it, it's a couple different things. One, I have petitioned for several years and I've lived here now for eight and a half um, to get help from the town on putting up sidewalks, curbing um, to preserve the tree line. I've been turned down every single time. I have people that pull up as it is onto the lawn, onto the sidewalk. We have little kids trying to ride bikes. We've gone to the preschool down the street in which in the winter, even this past winter, I had a three and four year old hand in hand in the middle of the street in the ice storm because nobody is shoveling any of those walks. The condominiums don't plow it. And so there's been really no um, talk through of what that snow removal is gonna look like. And with no curbs and all day employee parking, it's just gonna continue to erode that tree line. Um, and that's something I'd love to the town to really consider further before passing some of these things through. Um, so I guess my, my ask today is just in the time that we're in with the pandemic and so many things, you know, everybody's working from home. No one's allowed to go into their office. My husband's office won't even be open until February in downtown Boston. So we're moving all of a sudden street parking and eliminating the ability for people to stop by to drop off and help out with the kids is, is really just an extra burden on top of everything else that I really would hope that you guys delay and really think through, or at the very least for that outer core, um, say no to that part of this parking plan and keep it to the downtown part. Because again, this is a residential street. Um, and I feel like these heavily regulated parking things are being pushed through um, with really very little knowledge of us residents and any consideration of, of what our thoughts were. No one asked me, I didn't get an email. If I did, it was buried under a lot of stuff from the town. Um, and with schools not open, this is just honestly another, it's just making it more difficult than it needs to be, is my personal kind of thought process. So I thank you for hearing my rant on the topic, but I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Brooke, any, any questions for Brooke? I feel like I talked really fast. Did it make sense? Yes. <laughs> Karen. Thank you, Brooke. Um, um, thank you for sharing your story um, because everyone's family is unique and now we're all squashed into this town 24 by seven. So um, <laughs> I just wanted to ask you today, how is the parking on your street? Do you have any issues finding parking? Um, what is it like Somerville on your street? Because I no, I would say today I don't personally have a lot of trouble finding parking. Typically, if I have um, guests, and I'm not throwing wild parties by any means, don't get me wrong, um, they can find a spot. There tends to be a lot of people who park at the front end of my street or the end, I guess, because it's one way over near um, Lowell Street. But again, everyone's there's no curbing there's no sidewalk people are up onto the sidewalk um there's constantly trash in everybody's tree lawn nip bottles everywhere um and i feel like if now you're inviting town employees to purposely park there which maybe they didn't realize there was space to park there as of now you're just going to increase that potential problem without having addressed the sidewalks the curbing or any of that information as well um so it's been honestly fine as it is with the exception of the lack of curbing sidewalks and, and trash that's building up from people who are figuring out that yes, there's spaces available there. I guess my biggest concern is like, that's a residential area of the street and none of the other neighborhoods, none of the other streets in the same neighborhood are being asked to change their parking. And so like in my, I have no family in town. We are all working from home. School is not open. And so if I have my sister come up to help me for a week, she can't park. Like that's super frustrating, right? And I don't, yes, I might be able to get a sticker for me, but what about anybody else who's helping me out, right? So like if I'm having somebody shuttle one kid to school or to a pod or to a tutor and then come back, like then they can't find parking and they're walking up in the middle of the winter from the bottom of the hill that's not plowed and this, you know, the sidewalks aren't cleared. That's just a dangerous situation. Um, so I would really hope that from a, residential standpoint, you really consider those pink outer
core or whatever you want to call it, that that's in fact a residential street. There's not one single business on our street. Thank you. Thanks. I think we're going to let you put your kids to bed. Thank you. They really need to go. <laughs> open school. Open school. That's my last thing. Okay. Thank you, Brooke. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Caitlin, who's next? Um, Rob Skinner. Rob Skinner. Hi, Rob, we don't have video, but I think we see. Perfect, you thank you. Can you hear me? We can, please. If you could just introduce yourself and your address, please. We'd appreciate it. Sure, it's Rob Skinner, 62 Sanborn Street. Um, <clears throat> first, I would say I would, uh, I completely agree with Brooke and Dave. The first I've heard of this, now we've known that there's parking issues throughout town, but the first I've heard about it was a text message I got yesterday. Um, and apparently there was a notice in the water bill I find it ironic if I was to go for a variance, I'd have to send certified registered mail and multiple public notices to all of my neighbors. But where the town to do something, I know I get a text message and an extraneous piece of paper in the water bill. I just don't think that is a good faith effort when the changes are so significant. So that's just a comment. Um, so I live at the top of Sanborn Street um, across the street from the Northeast Ballet School, which went in about five years ago. And we were told, and we fought this, we were told that there would only be drop-offs to dance school, maybe between three and five on weeknights. That's fine. This, the dance school is now turned into a conservancy. Drop-offs start at 7 a.m. They go to 7 p.m. six days a week. My driveway is constantly blocked by parents who don't really seem to care. I haven't been able to get the police department really interested in even writing parking tickets. So now we want to invite more people. We've already done our fair share with the dancing school. And the woman that runs the school is a you know, very nice woman. She can't really control you know, her customers, I guess. But we've already put up with this. And now we're going to invite town employees. And I'm not I actually can confused could you clear up when we say employee parking is that only reading town employees or is that an employee of cvs for instance so that's all employees right so if i start a business and i come into town and i can't park my employees it's disingenuous to force that requirement on the residents right i, I just don't i guess i don't understand that a better solution to me would be why don't we buy the Walgreens or the Rite Aid, knock the building down and make a municipal parking lot? Um, to force this out into the residential areas, I think is an unfair burden on the residents. Is, you know, if I have two children right now, I have two older children, they're both home from college because of the pandemic. They're parking on the street. What happens when this goes into play, takes effect? Can, can my kids no longer park on the street? If you know, to Brooke's point, if I have a gathering midweek and I invite six people over, where are they supposed to park? It is almost seems like an unfair taking from my property because we're going to have CVS employees parking in front of my house, but I'm not allowed to. Um, so that's another comment. The last thing I would say is I've read up on this in the last 24 hours. Thankfully, one of my neighbors alerted me to this. We've got, it looks like an inner core and an outer core. And we're trying to make all of these changes during a pandemic when traffic patterns, work patterns are all disrupted. It almost seems like this is a phased approach. Why would we not start with the inner core, make the change, and let's see what the impact is before we go to the outer core, right? Phase one is the inner core. I'm all for two hour parking downtown. I think there are squatters that sit there all day and that's probably not appropriate, right? Because I try to go downtown and it would be nice if the space is turned over. I would say free two hour parking and then you have to leave or you get a ticket is completely appropriate for a downtown business district. But why would we not try to solve that problem first and see how that works? And then move to phase two, because right now commuter pro, uh, traffic patterns and all are, are so disrupted. Any change we made now might not even work in 12 months when hopefully things go back to normal. 
So I, those are my comments. I, I think um, pushing it out into the residential streets when we haven't even addressed the problem downtown, let's fix the downtown problem first, which is the inner core and see how that works. And let's move to the outer core at a later date. But I think it's too big of an issue um, given the lack of notice, quite frankly, to solve over Zoom. A at a minimum, I would, I would urge the board to put off the vote until this gets a, a fair and open uh, hearing in a, in a better setting than Zoom, quite honestly. And I'm good, I have no kids to put to bed, but thank you. Thanks, Rob. Any questions for, for Rob while he's on? Great. Um, I was going to say, should we clarify his question about what his kids can do if we make these changes? Please, that'd be great. Please. So um, your question about what your college age kids can do if they need to park on the street is that um, they could go to the police department and apply for an employee permit. Um, we have a program in place for residents to do exactly that when they have a um, an employee parking restriction along their property frontage. Okay, so what do I do if I have a birthday party and I invite 10 people over? Do they all have to go to the police department and apply for a permit? No, so there will be public two hour parking. Um, I should have clarified earlier that the restrictions are only proposed during the hours of eight to five Monday through Friday. So it would not include weekends or evenings. Um, mm -hmm. The um, These areas where we looked to uh, increase um, locations for employee parking were chosen for different reasons, but partly because we felt like there were the the homes that were there, um, you know, had dedicated off street parking and whether that's it's sufficient or not is is an open question, but it does seem that most homes along Linden Street, Sanborn Street, those other areas that along the, the eastern side of Main Street where we're looking at this have dedicated off street parking. Um, so there would still be opportunities for people to come visit you um, and park on the street. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Sure. And is the possibility that the uh, employee parking for college students could include a requirement to do chores at the house? That'd be fine. That would actually be great. Maybe they could put Brooks kids to bed. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Um, Caitlin, we have another person coming. Yes. Karen Rose Gillis. Karen Rose Gillis. So missing always so quick on the uh, on the uptake here. Karen, we're seeing you on screen, not with video, and your audio says it's now connected. Are you able to hear us, Karen? Looks like she's muted. Karen, either. Oh, yep, yeah, you're on mute. on mute. Can you unmute yourself, Karen? Uh, Caitlin, can you push a, a request to unmute to her? Uh, is not letting me unmute her for some reason. Oh, Karen, you there? Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yay. Oh, here we go. Oh, well, you can't see me, but that's, I'll, I'll take one. <laughs> oh, there we go. I got it now. Um, hi, my name is Karen Rose Gillis. I live at 69 Linden Street. Um, I'm not going to repeat anything that anyone else said tonight because everybody has. Um... Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay. I unmute. And see you both. Yep. Oh, great. I had to unmute something. Um, so I'm not going to repeat anything that anybody has to say that has already been said. My issue now is that now I can't hear you. We were all quiet, but we were Oh, to... okay, sorry. <laughs> um, on the lower level of Linden by the church, I just wanted to point out that on the proposed side where they're gonna have the employee to our parking, there's an embankment that runs past the condos in the front of my house. And um, 
as a result of that, if that's where people are going to be parking, which we're hoping you vote no tonight, um, snow is an issue. If there's a passenger in the car, they won't be able to get out of their car unless they park two feet into the street even farther. And that's kind of a consideration that I really think should be um, taken. So I just wanted to point that out that the lower part of the street is really difficult for parking on that side, which is proposed to be the permit parking. Great. In any, so I assume you're in support of the other comments. Any other uh, aspects you wanted to share? Um, that was pretty much, I mean, Brooke did a great job of explaining all the different issues. Um, I think that the notice issue is a huge problem and I really would appreciate the board and the town basically giving a lot more thought to how they inform residents of what's going on in their neighborhoods. I mean, I think eight months ago would have been a great time to have all of us involved in these discussions before they got as far away as they got. Um, the only way I found out about this whole thing was I happened to be on the website um, looking for fence permit information and I saw downtown parking issues and I still didn't think it had anything to do with me because this is the residential part and we would never think that we were part of the downtown parking issue. So I happened to click on it and this was in the middle of August and I happened to find the map and I just happened to be like, well, wait a minute, what are they proposing? So I went to the, one of the Zoom meetings and as informative as it was, um, and the maps and all the information, it really didn't answer any of the questions I had for what would happen if, you know, what about guests? What about parking? You know, I have four cars in my driveway now. You know, it was, it was, it was nice for Julie to be able to get information from us, but we really didn't get a lot of information back. And then it kind of dropped to the side and none of my neighbors knew about it. And once I started talking about it, um, even last night's message, it still didn't impact that it had to do with us because it referenced downtown parking. So I think that there needs to be a much more open um, dialogue or open communication to say exactly what it was. Um, downtown parking to us is on the other side of Wolverine Street. And I think this was a very deceptive um, way to do it. We would have been happy to participate in January with the meetings and given tons of suggestions. And I think it would have been great to be involved, but we never really heard about it. So I. That's, that's where I stand on the whole notice issue. I just think it was very poorly done. And I probably imagine it's poorly done with a lot of other projects that are done in town. And I think the residents would be a much more willing to be pleasant and help if they knew what was going on before it was a done deal. Great, uh, questions, board members? No, thanks, Karen, much right, appreciated. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. For joining. Do we have anyone else in the waiting room, Caitlin? We do not. So no, um, that's it. if there are people who are watching or listening um, that um, would like to still make a comment, um, we would invite you over the next couple of minutes to send an email to selectboard at ci.reading.ma.us. Um, and we will we'll try to get you in. Um, if we could, um, Julie, you had suggested that maybe Matt uh, would have some comments. Maybe it's a good time to allow for that to take place. Um, still allowing some folks to come in if they want to uh, join in the public hearing. And then after that, we'll close the public hearing. So Matt, if that, is that all right with you, Julie? Yeah, that's fine. And Matt, I just let you know, I can screen share your presentation if you need me to. Um, I, I mean, I guess there's just, uh, just from listening to all the comments and what everyone's been discussing, I think there's some, you know, just clarification um, in terms of the study that was done um, and how we look at um, parking um, in a larger district. And so I think the first thing just to understand is that when you're doing a study, um, just based on how you have to conduct it, you come up with a general study area. Um, it typically for a downtown study area, we do look at those areas and we work with the communities to take the core area, which is you know typically the big, where the most of the businesses are, which we did. And then you really look at the surrounding streets that have the greatest connectivity to and from um, that core, and that's a lot of that's how we will actually. That's where we usually document the number of spaces that are there, what the current regulations are, etc. Um, I just wanted to say, I mean, there are definitely two distinct, um, I think, concerns or issues that have been raised tonight. Um, one is, you know, the idea of changing regulations um, within the downtown, particularly the paid kiosks, um, and then the other is the residential. Um, 
I think the one thing to, to note about when it comes to the concern over employee parking, um, when these re recommendations come together, the idea is, is there's two pieces to this. And I just wanted to try to explain this and I've just been taking some notes. So the first thing is, this is not saying that every person that works in downtown is going to be parking on these streets. The reality is, is when you look at a lot of the detailed data that's been presented with both within the report, but also um, in different um, presentations we've given, the vast majority of parking in Reading is actually public, is privately owned. And so for instance, you know, when you look at this, oh, there's over 1,556 off street privately held, privately controlled parking spaces. That's where many of the employees work at different businesses and that's where they park. That's where residents in many of the, um, and many buildings, we don't, that's not counting like people with driveways and garages, um, park in, you know, it's say an apartment and condominium complexes. Um, the reality is, is that you only have 321 total public off street spaces. And of those about 160 are within two lots we've been discussing. So you really do have a very limited supply of publicly available um, parking. You know, some of the park, public parking we're talking is like town hall and things like that. So what we try to do is we try to weigh what we're looking at. And the reality is, is that you, you do have a, a complex downtown in terms of how your streets are arranged. You have, a, you have a commuter rail station, you have your kind of your main spine along Main Street, a developing spine even, um, as we talk along Haven, I've actually been working um, with the town of Reading over the years, not just in Nelson Niagara, but in a previous capacity at other jobs. So I've really seen it develop. And so I think that's really important. Um, there was one comment, for instance, you know, so why would we do this where the report says that paid parking would be a long term? Um, what we actually noted is that in the medium term, when we look at 85% utilization, which is like your key metric, that's when people perceive parking to be full, that we suggested a pilot. Um, and that's really the way you should be looking at this. This is your pilot for these off street lots, which are have been consistently, particularly when you're um, CVS, the CVS ladder at the upper lot. Um, during your peak during daytime, it does exceed that it's over 90% full and that's when you actually have to start really thinking about how that parking is being used. Um, and so the reason why a pilot would be appropriate and using kiosks and paid parking is that it's very difficult to manage parking that allows for two, four hour. It's very time and staff intensive when you do not have things like meters. So the idea that a lot of those parking spaces are being occupied by people who are using those within the, the I would say the acceptable time limits is gonna be much more difficult to manage. So that's one of the advantages of adding that kiosk because what you can do is you can really start managing that because people will make a choice. Will they circle? Will they find parking on street because it's free? Will they opt to get an employee pass because it's now an option? All those pieces, because it's a very complex beast. So the idea is this is about learning how to manage your parking through different strategies. And some of that, you know, is offering that free parking on street. And there's, I'm trying to remember, I was just looking and I was writing it down, but you have far more on street parking in your downtown um, that's publicly available than you do on this lot. So you're really leaving a lot of spaces available for people who do not want to pay. And then, but if they do, and they're gonna be there longer, then they have the option of going and paying for that space. Um, I think the idea of employees, it's much easier for an, uh, I would say, a free parking lot to offer for like you know up to four hours of parking for that one car then to move you know in the middle of the day and come back so i think there's just you have to look at it from a slightly different lens in terms of i would say just why is this being done because there's been data um, when we go back to the utilization yes we did basically we uh, partially part of a tuesday and then a full day thursday but we also look back to the 2009 study um, which we did and it was actually fairly consistent and one of the main pieces that was starting to drive some of the concern was development in terms of the parking and when we look at you know haven street for instance with more development now that has been built um, that's when you really start seeing the pressures um, that can apply. And it can be often, you know, for someone just said like a visitor. So if someone in the downtown has visitors coming and they're taking up that key parking that is needed for your businesses to succeed, that's a problem. And that's why we start talking about these kinds of strategies. You want to make sure you have that available parking because that's what's essential for those downtown businesses to, um, I would say, not only to survive, but thrive. Um, and it's also weighed with the idea that you're adding more people to the downtown, which you've done, which is great too, because you're actually adding um, basically a, 
a captive audience for many of these um, new businesses or existing businesses. So that's how we start to look at it. And then you start to kind of radiate out. Um, that's why you, you place that employee parking um, on some of the neighboring streets um, during the day, Monday through Friday. Um, as we said, this does not affect, uh, that does not give them valid parking on um, a Saturday, Sunday. Um, it's really during those key commuting hours where you have a lot of different, um, I would say, um, competing interests, whether it's the commuter parking. Like, I don't, I, I wouldn't call someone like squatting. I think people do and make the choices that are best for them. Um, and if that means using free parking somewhere that's in an unregulated street, that's what they'll do and they'll walk further. Um, I think if there are some dedicated streets, that's really good um, because then it forms an understanding of the system. I'm not gonna lie, there's always there's always differences of opinions. There's also very different realities and circumstances. And I do this in many different communities. So I think there's been a lot of thought in this. I know that the, the town has been studying this for a long time, um, but I think what we're really talking about here are changes that are intended to benefit the downtown. Um, and. I think as people were saying, I think there's a lot of good things that are in place. Like the fact that on an employee street that you can still get a pass for free as a resident, that's great. I also think it's also about enforcement. Um, I think you ha there has to be policies for enforcements on these streets. Um, and that's part of any strategy. Um, the idea isn't to start having people come you know, I would say, sorry, your enforcement or your police coming down every street every 10, 15 minutes in those residential zones, they're really in place so that when there, a problem arises, that then you can start looking. And then that's when you send that enforcement to make sure that people start understanding. So, you know, that while there's a lot, I would say there's a lot to unlock here. Um, but the idea is to create a strategy that can be not only formalized so that there is a predictability to the system, but also then there's going to be some policies and procedures that you all have to discuss on the other side about how often you enforce, what that means, how are you giving warnings out as opposed to tickets? So for instance, I know there's always concern when you go to paid parking. If you install a kiosk, for instance, and you start ticketing that first day, that would be ridiculous. You have to do some kind of, um, I would say a warning system, you know, where you get little notes on your card, by the way, this is this has changed. You can add things like a free, you know, one free ticket for that person who didn't realize it. And many cities have that in towns. So I would just like to say that, you know, there, it, there, was, a, there was a lot of thought and I've been having conversations over the last year um, on a regular basis you know, just to kind of start talking through, you know, is this the, is this the point where this pilot would be smart? Um, and to me, it, as from what I have learned through all of my work in parking, this does seem the right time, um, particularly because you're offering a lot of free parking on street. Um, I think what you're just trying to do is you're starting to really create a more managed district parking, for instance. So um, I know I just said a lot, um, but my brain goes kind of crazy with all this because there are so many pieces with it. Um, but it is about a strategy and it is ultimately about fairness. Um, because for instance, I think someone said, you know, res I think the common comment that comes like, I'm a resident of the town. Um, and that's a very valid point. However, for people, for instance, I don't know where different people live, but for someone who lives in a more suburban street that's nowhere near business, you are not going to have people coming and parking in your neighborhood when you are living in a downtown and you are in that more walkable area and people are coming to that, there is some additional needs for regulation. And that's why they, that's why that happens. Um, so in, in my mind, that's actually a very fair policy. Um, I think that's actually protecting um, the residents of that, of that area, that downtown adjacent area so that they have the same ability in many instances to have some control over um, the ability to park on their street um, to or who's parking on their street. So I think I think we always have to consider the context, um, the reality of what the system is, the reality of what other parts of town are that do not have the same kind of parking pressures, um, and then think from that from that perspective. Thanks, ma'am. Caitlin, anyone else that has requested to speak? Um, yes, I just sent the invite to one person. I don't see him in the waiting room yet, but, and then I just, someone sent an email, but I wasn't clear if they wanted to speak or not. So I asked if they wanted to speak and I'm waiting to hear back. All right, board members, any questions for, for Matt? I think what we should probably do is see if anyone else wants to um, speak. If they do great, if not, let's close the public hearing and then we can move to deliberations. Christine. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to say the reason why we chose some of the streets such as Lindbourne and Sandin, uh, um, Sanborn, sorry, is because of in the traffic roads and regs, those streets actually do fall under the downtown business district area. So even though those parts of them have been unregulated thus far, they are actually considered part of the downtown district area in our rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. um, and Sanborn um, is very heavily utilized every day. So I would, I would just be worried that if we only voted on the inner core and didn't worry about the outer core, then the employees are going to go there all day anyway, unregulated at all. Um, and free for all on these streets that we're trying to regulate. But that's all I wanted to clarify is that I know those residents um, feel it's residential, but in our traffic rules, it actually is part of the downtown business district. Thank you. Chief Clark. Clark, and just to back up a Lieutenant Amadola said, regulation helps us with enforcement. Some of the issues we're having, like uh, Lieutenant Amadola just mentioned that upper part of San Juan Street, it's not regulated. So enforcement becomes more difficult for us when it's not regulated and regulation is about helping enforcement. That doesn't mean we go out and ticket every single person with towing cars, anything like that. We're not suggesting that, but it gives us a chance when there is issues in the neighborhood, stricter regulations allow us to deal with the problem better and quicker and the regulations help us that. And yeah, we start out with warnings. We can educate. That's great, but it gives us a chance to then, if there's a constant problem to give tickets out, and help it better. That's why we're asking for some of the streets that aren't regulated to be regulated to again help us with enforcement and help us do our job. Great. Thank you. Matt, did I see your hand? Yeah, and <laughs> I just lost my train of thought because I was actually just listening and that's a, that's a very important point is that without regulation many problems actually um, that may arise are actually the town is then unable to do anything because it's just permitted. Um, so I think that's just something to be said. I'm trying to think about what the previous question was. Sorry, it'll come back to me and then I'll just raise my hand again. Yeah. Caitlin, any resolution on the two people? Yes, we have um, Lawrence Muse coming in now. Great. Hi, Lawrence. Um, you are on mute. There you are. You're, you're, you're in San Francisco, but there you are. Yes. Hello, uh, Lawrence Muse, 217 Lowell Street. I just had one quick uh, comment. With all these construction projects that are going on that are permitted for one vehicle per house, like the uh, apartment building on Lincoln Street, uh, when in the winter time, there's like if you drive by right now, on that, uh, I gotta exit out. Uh, with these with these apartment buildings with one parking spot, if you drive by the Lincoln Street building right now, there's about ten or fifteen cars outside because there's no room for them. Where are they gonna park in the winter time? And that's just one building out of three or four they're building. I can respond, Mark, if that's okay. Please. Um, during the daytime, like I said, the regulations fall up and they get ticketed based on the regulations there. Uh, during winter time, the, that's when the all night, all night parking ban is enforced and they'll be ticketed. And if it's impeding snow removal, um, we, don't love to do it, but sometimes we've had to. If the DPW is having an issue plowing safely, we do can, under the current guidelines, ticket and tow the car. Um, but that's just during snowstorms during the winter part of it when the all-night parking ban is enforced. Um, other than that, outside of that in the summertime, any depending on, again, it comes down to regulation. If the street's regulated, we enforce the regulated part of the uh, parking down there. I'd like to add to that. When it, you know, that's also when you're talking about parking, um, particularly in a downtown environment where if someone rents a, a, an apartment and there's one parking space, that is a choice they make. And you know the way that it works right now is, and it works in I would say most communities in a downtown, typically overnight parking is allowed to kind of give that little buffer, that time when that parking is not used very much. Um, and those are the cars that are often most likely to leave during the day, during the working hours, et cetera. Um, I think what you need to kind of think about in that sense is that um, you have to, that's why you wanna have regulation because there's policies in place um, you know, when it comes to parking minimums and maximums, et cetera, that are intended to create
create the environment you're looking for. Um, and one of the most important things in a downtown is to get, first of all, is to have people. Um, the retail market has changed drastically. Someone earlier commented that you have folks who are going to shop over in Burlington and Linfield. If they're going to Market Street or if they're going to the Burlington Mall or if they're going to you know, strip commercial, that is not downtown. People who are coming to downtown are specifically choosing to go to the businesses that are there, whether it's grabbing a coffee, whether it's going into the CVS, um, going into um, get some dry cleaning or pick up a pizza, things like that. It's a very different context. And that's why you have to have a much more regulated system and a, or a more formalized system because you don't have green fields in vast parking lots. Um, you know, there's, there's certain towns that, you know, have tons of parking behind every kind of, in the back of almost every building. That's not, that's not Reading. You have a very finite supply of land that can be used for parking. Um, and, you know, so what you want to be doing is making sure the val that valuable asset you have is being used as efficiently as possible. And that's why a lot of these processes have been developed or these strategies in order to help you do that, particularly given actually that concern you were just saying, um, if, there's, if there are some are additional cars that are there, um, you're actually creating an environment where during the day that's not possible. They just won't be able to park and take up that valuable real estate. Because the road's a valuable real estate that actually costs a lot of money to maintain. Thanks. Any, any other comments, Lauren? Oh, nope, no, that's it. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Yep. I remember what I was going to say. I think the one thing that everyone should also be remembering is that when, when a parking plan is coming together like this, there's going to be revisions over time and there's going to be changes to surrounding streets. Um, you know, if you're, you're going to see places where issues may arise, never going to be 100% fixed in one, you know, in one change. Um, I was a parking director for a very, very crowded parking area and a parking plan was, con the parking plan is, is being revised at all times. There's different streets that are coming to where I was, it's a city, it's a council. So it would be going to a commission to see if you wanna to change to a residential permit. One of the things that would be very helpful um, in, you know, in the long term is that you know, once these are, is to also then remember that people can come to, you know, to the, the select board and they can request that they are added to this. And there can be a process that can be added on and it has to make sense. So that's something I think that is always kind of, should always be in the back of everyone's minds. And that's part of just any kind of strategy. It could, you know, zoning isn't forever. You change zoning and you go through a process there's requests, there's changes to the streets, there's changes to how people live. Um, you know, there's one of the main problems that's arisen in many places is that parking is becoming really challenging in many of these smaller downtowns because they're more attractive to people, not just the downtown, but the community in which they're in. So if that becomes one of the draws, you wanna make sure that people, many people are able to actually use that. And that's why you've created, that's why you, We've worked with you and you've worked really, really a lot to come up with these recommendations so that you're giving many options. You may, you may not, and this I will say this and I say it every time, you are likely not ever going to get that parking space you want right in front of that shop. You certainly do not want an employee parking in that parking space all day long. That's why you're creating all of these um, different types of regulations. So I would just say that there's always going to be, you know, there's always going to be some changes that will be required afterwards, but that's part of the process. Um, the goal is to actually create a more efficient system over time, and that requires some changes um, to start it. Um, so I think Thanks, that's Matt. really good. At. Let's, Kate, we have one last person, and then I think we will close the public hearing. Yes, Michelle Souza. Michelle Souza. Hi, Michelle. Hi, how are you? Good. Thank you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, so my name is Michelle Souza. I live at the very top of San Juan Street. Um, I'm in a little bit of a unique situation because I am a resident, but I also operate a business out of my house. Um, I guess my first issue is the notification process. Um, you know, my email address, my phone number, it's all on the internet. I did not receive any notification about this. Um, I randomly heard about it from a neighbor down the street yesterday. Um, and 
if anybody had asked for my feedback, I would have told them that these new parking um, changes are going to affect my personal business um, because basically I have a um, I have a licensed home daycare, so my family's drop off and pick up. Now they're not here for long, but if I have all the parking spots outside my street taken from seven to five Monday through Friday, even getting a permit from the police station is not going to do anything if there's no parking spots to begin with. So these changes are going to affect my business, a really resident's business. So I guess notification is the biggest issue um, that I have. And for that reason, I'm you know, strongly urging the board to either vote no or to delay this until a later time where it's fair for all the people that are actually going to be affected by this change um, to actually be given a chance to look at it and look at the options and hear exactly what it's going to do personally to us. Thank you, Michelle. Any questions for Michelle? Carla. Michelle, currently, um, do you have any, do your parents or caregivers have any issues now? I'm sure there's some spots not always open or is it, is it okay? No, no issue. No issues. Like I said, they're only here for five minutes twice a day, but in those five minutes twice a day, there are parking spots. So even if you were to say, you know, we could get some kind of sticker um, where we could pass around or anything like that, it's not going to help the situation if every single parking spot outside my house along my whole street is gone. Ha ha that's not going to help at all. And then I have families, you know, taking small children out of cars and parking two blocks away. That's not, that's going to negatively affect my business. So to hear about this less than 24 hours ago, just in a random conversation, is, is honestly, I, I, was, I was shocked to say the least. I just have a question. That'd be, I'm just curious, what time are the, are the typical pickup and drop-offs for your daycare? Um, anywhere between seven and nine and then four and five. So it would be, it would be the times that those spots would be taken all day. You know, I, I guess the, the, the issue, the, the main issue is the notification. Had anybody reached out to me via phone, via mail, knocked on my door, um, I could have provided this feedback. So I just, I, I guess I'm, I'm just confused how a vote can go ahead tonight with no um, notifications to the actual residents and business owners like myself who are going to be negatively affected by this. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. May I ask Michelle a quick question? Please, Julie. So um, Michelle, what happens with your large off-street driveway parking area? That do your um, clients not use that for pick up and drop off, or is it being used by somebody else? You mean my Mark, I'd like to interrupt here. Oh, it, excuse me. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Um, I think I want to be careful here in that how residents use their private property is not the topic of discussion here. It's how the streets are being used um, and the regulations that we're considering enforcing. Um, so you can feel free to answer. I don't want to stop you, um, but I want to make sure that how you use your property is is not what um, we're going to base decisions on. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, Matt, before uh, continuing, my suggestion, board members, is that we close the public hearing at this point. We take a couple of minute break and just stretch, and then we come back and do the board part of the discussion. Is that acceptable to all? Okay, so um, Carlo, can I ask for a motion to close the public hearing, please? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, uh, motion to close the public hearing on the downtown parking. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Karen. Any further discussion? No, nope, we'll take a vote as I'm seeing people in the window. Carlo? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. Anne? 
Karen, you're on mute. Yes, sorry. Thank you. And Mark, yes. So we're five zero. Uh, thank you to the, the public for, for participating. Um, select board, let's take five minutes just to um, just to stretch and then we'll we'll come back. What I would ask is the um, the members of the public, if you would um, kind of disengage from the Zoom and please feel free to join on RCTV or YouTube or Facebook. Thank you, folks. Let's come back at, uh, oh, let's say 915, please. Thanks.
thinking what um, probably makes sense from here, I'll, I'll check in with the board members, but to go through kind of the four items, uh, Julie, that you have listed kind of on pages 27 to, I guess, to 30, and see if there are questions or comments that come through from those. Sounds good. Um, just let me know when you want me to get started. One second. Lisa, I don't know if you are, are, are still monitoring. Can I ask that you um, leave the Zoom side of this and, and observe on either RCTV or YouTube or Facebook, please? Thank you. Um, is Vanessa back? Yeah, and Carlo still. Okay. Mark, I'm back. I'm just getting settled. Okay, great. Carlo, are you back? Let's hang on one more second here. Oh, there you are. Great. You, you jumped the screen on me. <laughs> okay, I'm going to call the select board back to order. Um, so, folks, we, we, um, we've heard from the public. What I was going to suggest is that in Julie's presentation, there are four section or four sheets um, starting at oh julie has got them up on the on the screen right now and we talk through those uh see what questions or comments that there are kind of one at a time and then based on that we can talk about uh the request for votes for this evening and, and how we might go through that but i think these are the kind of the bigger topics and it'd be best to go through these first is that that all right with all yep okay, okay mark I have, I have yep. a question. Yep, please. Um, so if we have sort of broader themed issues that aren't necessary or concerns or questions, um, should we do those now as opposed to going through the four main items in Julie's presentation? Sure. Yeah, you have general questions, please. Okay. Sure. Um, so a little bit um, less um, questions, um, more broader picture concerns. So. Um, for full disclosure, I live um, adjacent to some of these areas being discussed, um, though not any of the streets actually being voted on. Um, I didn't receive any notification that this was coming until the call went out last night at 8.15. Um, so I am very concerned that we are potentially voting on parking regulations that will drastically affect these neighborhoods and the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, and we have given, well, we have had public sessions where people can participate if they are aware. Um, we have not actively and proactively notified any of these residents that are specifically affected by these changes. Um, we heard from numerous of these um, residents tonight. So I, I'll be honest, I am not comfortable on voting um, on anything that's going to affect um, these specific streets. I'm comfortable on voting on some of the more general terms, um, but we saw what happened with the water tower, with Venetian Moon, when affected people are not notified. Um, and I, I am frustrated that we are facing this issue again, um, when we know that people want to be informed when government is making changes that will affect them and on their behalf. Um, so I think it is a mistake to move forward with some of these regulation changes at this time. Um, uh, you know, um, bear with me. Uh, I have more items that are specific to some of the feedback that we've gotten specific to some of the individual um, motions before us, but I, I so this, this, Focus, this lack of notification is a huge problem um, for me personally. So I, that, that's my general piece. And I'll say more as we progress. Thanks, Vanessa. Karen. I'm going to echo Vanessa. That has been, I visited the water tower. I am hearing exactly the same thing from those residents. Um, and this concerns me. Um, I did get calls from residents in these areas. And I think about what would I think if my neighborhood was going to experience dramatic changes um, 
it, how would I feel if I didn't receive a certified letter? Um, and I think about when I want to do something to my property and I need to go get a variance, what do I, or a special permission, um, what do I need to do? I need to go to town hall. I need to get a list of the abutters. I need to send certified letters to all of them. I, I am, I'm very concerned that this keeps coming up again and again. And I, so I share Vanessa's concerns and um, I don't think that I don't think that we've had the right kind of dialogue for these particular neighbors, uh, this particular neighborhood, uh, primarily Linden and Sanborn. Um, some of the issues that um, the chief has raised about being able to enforce neighbor neighborhoods, parking in neighborhoods to keep it available for neighbors and, and businesses. I'm not comfortable voting on this either. Uh, for those specific reasons, when we are going to do something that is going to affect property owners, I think the town needs to be equally um, responsible for notifying them in, in the strictest possible way, which which what anything that we already I already have to do if I want to get a special permission that I'm not allowed. Um, that's it. That's all I have to say on that particular topic. Thank you, Carlo. I just have a question either for Julie or for Chief Clark or anyone that can answer it. On those two, two particular streets where there's parking allowed on both sides, why can't that continue all of a sudden? Um, we have the engineering department take a look at it. Um, on, Sanborn is wide enough to have parking on both sides. That was not gonna change. Um, it was just gonna become regulated on both sides. Okay. Linden Street, however, if you were to regulate one side and make all the parking on one, it's not wide enough. And now actually, now that I've been driving down it a lot, looking at this, it probably needs a regulation. Um, the cars are kind of right now self-regulating, you know, one going up a little further than the other, but it's a very narrow street and probably could use already a no parking on one side. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Ann, would you like to weigh in? Sure. Um, so first I wanna say thank you to the staff for all of the work and creative thinking that's gone into this proposal. Um, I too have concerns about uh, the notice, particularly given our ex recent experiences with um, both the Venetian moon tent and with the water tower. Um, I know that in this case, um, there was uh, general and constructive notice provided, you know, it was properly noticed as public hearings are, are required to be, but there was not uh, specific and actual notice provided to affected residents um, for whom the parking situation would change on the street in front of their homes. Um, I um, was not able to attend the August meeting, um, the one select board meeting I have missed, um, given a longstanding family uh, commitment. But I did watch the video, and I kn I know that Vanessa had specifically requested that letters be mailed to residents' homes. Um, I take it that did not happen. I also am sensitive to the fact that particularly given a conversation um, the other day with Bob about uh, communications between um, the board and staff. It's um, not always clear what the town manager and town staff should do with uh, a comment or a recommendation made by one member of the board. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's ambiguous when one member of the, of the board indicates um, a preference for something. So I, I can appreciate that, but the reality is that actual notice was not provided to, to these residents. Um, I'm also sensitive to the fact that with respect to the parking kiosks are um, the um, Chamber of Commerce, uh, both the president and the executive director have asked that, um, that we defer on that. Um, if we were going to be taking that up, I have some actually some specific questions around privacy. That's not something we've discussed tonight, but was my um, first question that I had when I the, at the first meeting when Julie presented this proposal about how residents 
um, privacy considerations would be taken into account with a pay by plate kiosk parking um, situation. So if we are um, going to be voting on parking kiosks um, specifically, I do have um, some additional questions with respect to um, privacy considerations. Um, I think that's, I, I, I've had lots of thoughts. Uh, those are some preliminary ones. Thanks. Got it. Thanks. So, Mark, um, can I ask one more thing? Um, actually, let me go first so that I kind of have my say here as well first. Um, so, so this is, this as usual is a, is a, you know, a difficult scenario and that's why we're here trying to, you know, work through what's the best way to work it through. I think that a lot of the work that's been done and there's quite a bit, um, it makes very good sense. I think that if we are going to address the situation for businesses downtown, we need to find a way to open up parking for shoppers. It's not working. It may be working at the moment in COVID, although just barely, because we even found out we had some issues with that as, as we were talking about Venetian Moon in the CVS lot. Um, we're not addressing it right now. And if we don't take some action, that problem will continue. Um, meaning that the, the concerns about shopping downtown and, and helping the businesses downtown won't get resolved for, for some additional period of time. So I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that we've been talking about this for well over a year. Um, we've looked at these solutions, in fact, you know, much of these solutions for most of that time. Um, and you know, I, I hear you all loud and clear that you know, why aren't we able to, to kind of get more, I guess, resident engagement until kind of the night before or the night of, um, or, or even worse, the night after. So, you know, how, how do we kind of accommodate that? So I think that if we were not to move ahead on these things tonight, then some very specific things would need to take place in terms of action that we're requesting and then putting us in a position where we're going to need to take a vote and, and move this ahead. I, I think we're not doing anybody a service by kicking the can down the road here. Um, I appreciate it's COVID. It is a really difficult time. And, and I hear loud and clear that this probably isn't the first thing on people's minds. Uh, there, there are plenty of other things to be thinking about. You know, that said, how do we put together a structure that's going to work? If we wait until things are normal again, it may never happen. It may be a year away, and we're still going to have the problem. Um, so I don't think that we can kind of say, "Hey, we're you know, it can't happen during the Zoom era." I, I think that that's not an option. I think it has to be that. I think we can accommodate phone calls and things also, but we need to find if people aren't comfortable voting on this tonight or are going to vote against it tonight, then we need to be very specific in terms of what we'd be looking for, how it's going to take place, and how we can move this ahead. I'm, I'm a little concerned. I'm not, I'm not seeing in my own head how that happens yet. Um, you know, it, we clearly can talk to residents on, on the, the streets that are involved. Um, you know, as, as we approach winter, the, the emergency vehicle issue becomes more important in, in making sure that that's okay. And if, if, you know, if things aren't regulated and perhaps they should be, I think we need to take care of that. Um, I'm just, as, as much as I want to make sure we're hearing from everybody, I want to make sure that that we don't do that forever and find ourselves in a situation where we're not taking care of anybody's needs. So my, my comments there. Sorry, Vanessa, you were next. Thanks, Mark. Um, so I have three points. Um, the first is that from the beginning of when this um, parking revamp initiative was started, um, I had requested a larger um, investigation or study into the impact on the surrounding areas, both north and south of um, the outer core. Because my concern with these, um, the, where the boundaries have been set, and, and they may be set for very reasonable um, um, reasons, uh, but all we are doing in some of these cases is pushing the problem out to another neighborhood or to another street that then is going to ask for regulation as well. And then that that regulation just ends up pushing further and further out and affecting new communities. Um, I think, you know, Matt said something that I think was interesting, which was 
So you have to start somewhere and yes, there may be some struggles along the way and then, and then you work those out. Um, and I think that's true. Inevitably there will be unintended consequences. But right now we can clearly identify consequences. Um, they may not be intended, but they are inevitable given how we've structured this right now. And we've heard of some of them tonight from residents. Um, so I don't think it's a matter of needing to hear from everyone, but I think it is, no, we as board members are both are trying to do two things. And, and sometimes um, they're, they're in opposition to each other. One is what the town needs and one is what residents want. And we represent those residents and we have to look to the best interests of the community. Um, but right now, if we vote and we, and we choose to move this forward without input from the residents, then we are really falling short in our obligations and our responsibilities to these residents that we represent in these areas. Um, and, I, and I think that's really important to highlight. Um, and just, you know, you mentioned the idea of kicking the can down the road, Mark. I think there's a difference between kicking the can down the road just because you don't want to act on it um, and doing something and choosing um, intentional steps forward for how to do this correctly. Uh, and I, that would be my goal for tonight. Um, if there's, like I said, there's a couple of the motions that I'm totally fine voting for right now. Um, the leasing program is among them. Um, but I don't think we're ready yet. And I, I appreciate all the time that the staff has put into this that this board has put into this, um, but moving forward right now is premature and does a disservice to all of those that are gonna be affected, including um, the businesses and the employees because we haven't talked about how the town is gonna to maintain um, sidewalks and has the DPW been consulted on, are there areas where they store snow in some of these areas? Um, we don't know. Um, and, that's, and, and I won't even get into the kiosks yet. Um, so, I. I think we need to focus on how to move this forward and not voting on these motions tonight. That's yeah. my two. Thanks, Vanessa. Dan? Um, so I'm, I'm hearing um, whatever, what both Mark and Vanessa are saying. I was hoping to get a little bit of clarification from staff. I understand and I, and I respect all the work that they've done and I understand that staff would like us to vote tonight. So I want, I was hoping to hear a little bit more about that. Why does staff want to vote us to vote tonight? Which I certainly can appreciate. They've put in a lot of time, effort, energy and creative thinking um, to get us to here. Um, so I can, I can understand it would be, it would be great to have um, finality. Um, but because a lot of these um, solutions were developed pre-COVID and to a certain extent were in, in response to pre-COVID problems. Um, I, I'm wondering why tonight and what, what are the problems we're seeking to address that are, that are current and ongoing? I think one of the most instructive comments I heard tonight was from um, our police chief that you know providing additional regulation can allow them in fact to do more enforcement. Um, I was also wondering um, from staff's perspective, to what extent can we tease apart different recommendations? To, it seems like in a lot of ways, this is a package, but I, want, I'm, I don't know, you know if, we, if we address the inner core, but not the outer core, are we, are we creating a new problem by not allowing for sufficient employee parking? And I don't want to, you know, do, do it piecemeal in a way that is actually going to create, in, tr not actually solve any problem and just create a new one. So I guess the urgent, you know, uh, why now? Uh, why now? What current problems are we seeking to address? Um, and uh, to what extent can we tease apart the different pieces? All right, Mark, can I Clark, answer Please. All right. Okay. And um, and appreciate the feedback from all the select board. We really do. Part of it is a timing issue. January one is when the new we issue out the new stickers for twenty twenty one. I need to order those soon in order to have them more to implement the program. So 
some of the changes, uh, yes, there is a, a time limit. And that's what we've been trying to stress is because I need to be able to plan for all of 2021. So if we don't make some of the changes or the changes, it affects then basically, in some respects, we're locked until next fall when we're looking at 2022. Okay. And also the amount. So if, for example, you vote tonight to do away with the lease basis, that changes the amount of employee spaces there are, which changes the amount of employee passes I need to order. Um, if we regulate some of the streets, for us, it helps with, and I know you get a lot of um, comments, the board gets a lot of comments about the lack of enforcement of the police department. Regulating these streets helps us with the enforcement. The perfect example is that um, Sanborn Street. Part of the issue up there is it's unregulated. It affects us, our ability to enforce it. So some of it has to do with increasing the spots. And my concern is why I want to move is as these projects get done and more and more businesses come in, if we don't increase the amount of employee spaces, we're going to run out of the amount of employee passes. And nothing to me is going to kill the downtown more and the businesses down there and Julie and Erin and Jean's ability to draw new businesses in. When people come in and they sell a business and it sounds like, oh, this is great. I want to come into Reading and it's August. And they, and they hear about an employee parking program and they come to the police station and we have no passes left because we've already sold the existing quantity out. It happens now. It's been, and it's getting worse and worse every year. So part of it, what we want to do is we want to have extra spaces, ability to sell them, but also keep a, a, a small percentage left that when new businesses come in, Julie can sell that new business and sell Reading as a place that they want to be sell the parking program, there's nothing worse when she gets a phone call saying, you told me this, 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 and this, and we can't get that because we don't have it to provide. So some of it's a timing issue, some of it's regulation to help us with enforcement, and, um, but it's about ordering the right amount that we need. And, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I know Lieutenant Amadol will have no problem telling me if I'm speaking out of turn. Um, if some, I think it's more, there's all different things we're asking you to vote on, and I don't think it has to be the complete package um, I think you can review, am I wrong, Christine? No, that's why there are, that's why there's so many amendments because they could pick and choose whichever they would like to vote on. And you, you can pick and choose. You don't have to vote all of them. It's not a, it's not a do this or else. We try to give I, you a bunch I, of different I varieties. That, I knew that we could. I just didn't know if it would kind of blow things up in an unpredictable way if we did some, but not, or if there's some that are just going to create problems um, elsewhere if we're not, for example, if we don't do um, some of the employee parking in the outer core is, but do some of the other changes down closer to, uh, to the inner core, is that going to create a problem? I can jump in. Okay. Really cool. Sorry, go ahead, Julie. I was just going to say with regards to that specific question about inner core versus outer core, I do think that could be problematic um, doing like just the inner core and not the outer core, because if we relocate some of those employee spaces out of the inner core but don't put them anywhere in the outer core then we actually have fewer permits for employees that we can give out um, and fewer locations for them to park in so in some ways there are certain things i think can be teased out like the um, leasing program you could vote on separately and and we would um, figure out what the regulations would then become for those areas um, but i don't think doing the inner core as like a phase one with the outer core as phase two would work Okay, thank you. Senator Nemedola. All right, the only thing I want to say too is, I, I don't know, I guess maybe it seems rushed for the board, but I've been on the PTTF for since 2008, and this is as far as we've come, and I've dealt with the same parking complaints for the past like 10 years on. The employees take up all the parking. There's nowhere to park to go to a business. So I, I guess it seems rushed for you, but for me, it's a long time in the making to get this far. That's all I wanted to say. I think um, one thing I, I want to have us to think about also is, um, and to answer, uh, partially answer your question, and why tonight? Um, mm -hmm. So the way I've been viewing this is that, so COVID has caused a break in everything. One of the breaks is in a little bit of the pressure on parking at the moment in terms of is the downtown over full. At the same time, there's a lot of new development that has just come in. And, and we've received a lot of letters recently about that, you know, both pro and con. But the fact of the matter is, there's a lot of new development. There is a lot of new retail space that's also part of what's going on with that. So 
as things, as there is more traffic, and I'm going to assume at some point there will be, whether or not it gets back to the same level or higher, I can't answer, but there will be more traffic, there will be more needs for parking, I think the situation is going to get more difficult. And, you know, this feels like a very productive solution to it. I think, you know, again, we've spoken about it since October or so of last year. And, um, you know, things are- I don't, are, think, it, I don't are, think it feels, I don't think it feels rushed from my perspective, to be clear. Okay. I don't think it feels rushed. I think there, there was a, a notice issue. Um, yeah, no, and I'm, I'm, we're hearing that loud and clear. I think, you know, some residents have ex expressed that we're, we're talking through it as well. But, but I think that I'm um, just, you know, addressing the issue of, of you know, timing and, and yeah. what happens and, you know, is there another year to wait as an example? Mm -hmm. I think that's problematic um, on, on my take. Chief. Hey, Mark, just to kind of reiterate on your point, this, I think this is long overdue. I know Lieutenant Amador worked us when she was the traffic and safety officer. She worked on it as a sergeant. She's still working as a lieutenant. She just can't seem to get through this. Um, it's getting worse and it's significantly getting worse. And my concern is if we wait too long to start doing stuff, to start implementing changes see how those changes are working. I'm not saying this is a cure-all. I know at some point we're gonna to have to readjust some things, revisit some things based on the need and the needs of the downtown are constantly changing as different businesses come in and out. And I don't wanna, my concern is if we wait to a point where all of a sudden, hopefully the world goes back to normal soon. I don't know when soon is or what your definition of soon is, but all of a sudden there's now there's a major issue and it's too late almost to fix it. And now we don't know what to do. And now we are in a full blown rush to make changes. Um, that's why I was hoping to slowly start implementing some things, see what affects the neighborhoods, make some changes, revisit, come back to you. Okay, this isn't working. Let us address resident concerns, come back to you with some actual feedback and see how things are going. That's, a, that's what my hope is with this whole thing is to kind of do it some of it before it needs to get before it's too late is basically and it's getting to the point where before COVID hit it was actually getting too late and the complaints were going through the roof it was becoming a major issue for us and people coming in very upset because they couldn't get the parking they need which was affecting the downtown businesses I think more than anything was Julie and Erin and Gina selling downtown Reading again like I said and they can't provide what they sold and that's why I think affects businesses and our ability to sell writing more than anything just Mark if I might Please um, don't. Uh, I want to ask Julie a question um, Julie was about to do a different portion of the presentation do you think that <laughs> portion would help the board sort of segment uh, ideas into buckets to think about in terms of doing or not doing tonight Mark I have a suggestion can you let Julie answer that just for one second. Oh. Let's come back. It, it'll influence. Okay. It'll influence. Julie. <laughs> so I, I don't want to put the cart before the horse. It, it, it could help definitely. Um, and I, I do have a comment to make about the notification, um, if and when anyone wants to hear it. But I don't want to interrupt Vanessa. Yeah, could we hear from Vanessa? Sorry, please. Thanks. Um, so. I have, a, I have a statement and a proposal um, for how to move this forward. Um, so one, I, I really do appreciate uh, all the work that the staff has put into this. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I want the, the staff to know this is a, from, from everything that I've heard from this board, this is a board that wants to address the parking issue. Um, so that Lieutenant Amendola has been working on this for over a decade to me is crazy. Um, because that is definitely not how long I think it should take to make these kinds of changes. Um, the flip side of that, that, that statement is that this is too big of an issue to get wrong. And I don't think we're there yet. There are too many implications that haven't been considered. There are too many neighborhoods that haven't been informed. Um, the neighbors have only found, known about this for a couple of days that are going to be most impacted. Um, I think it is a huge mistake and a disservice to everyone that this is going to affect if we vote on this to move it forward um, as it stands now. So here's my proposal. Um, I would suggest that, um, and, and perhaps this is best to did following Julie's remaining um, portion of the presentation. 
um, I would ask that the staff tease out the areas that um, the board can act on now without having these ripple effects that we're talking about to the outer core um, that we can review at our next meeting, which I think is um, October 6th, Mark? Correct. Um, I think tonight, as part of this conversation, the board should create of all the items that we want incorporated in the next round, not, not for October 6th, um, but for whenever we review this next. Um, so that it is crystal clear for the staff, because to Anne's point, it is, it is challenging, I think, for the staff sometimes to know what is an individual request and what is a board request. So if we list everything out for them, they are fully prepared to come back to us with the answers that we're looking for. Um, and as part of that, I would ask the staff to create a detailed outreach plan um, and a timeline for the stages. And, and I understand that some of this is time sensitive and there's a pressure because of getting the stickers and implementing it for the, for the police department. Um, so I don't propose we kick this down for another year um, but we can't move forward without addressing some of these issues. We haven't talked a lot about electric vehicle charging stations. I know Karen has been beating this drum. Um, you know, that should be on the list. There's, there's, so, there's other items that, and maybe it was our fault for not having brought those forward or been clearer in the past, but we can do that now. Thanks, so that's, that's my suggested proposal for how we move forward. Um, I would ask um, for Carlo, Karen, you, you guys haven't um, had a chance to kind of get your second licks. Why don't you do that? And then Anne, I'll recognize you after that. Okay. Carlo or Karen, any? Well, I'll take a step oh, back. Oh, I, I agree with pretty much everything that everyone's saying, but what Mark and Chief Clark said in particular about addressing this issue as a former retailer in the town of Reading, um, with sign bylaw changes, surviving construction of downtown, parking has always been an issue and park parking will always be an issue, no matter what. Uh, parking management is the key. We have to make some steps forward, then take a step back. Make two steps forward, take a step back. I understand what happened tonight was not efficient and um, it wasn't enough notice given, but it, we're just gonna keep on beating the same drum and we're not gonna make everybody happy. Uh, what Mark said, with all these new storefronts coming online, uh, the challenge of COVID is one challenge. The challenge of filling even half of these spots is a monumentous challenge and also for the right tenants. We, nothing against uh, attorneys or, or accountants, but we don't want, we want retailers, we want uh, food stores, we want coffee shops, we want whatever we want. We want foot traffic. We don't want services, nothing against them, but we want retailers, we want foot traffic. That's what downtown wants. That's what all this housing is for, provide foot traffic. So all the work that's been done, I've been following this as a citizen. I've been involved with it. I've gone to meetings when I was a business owner in town. And now my tenant downstairs is dealing with it. We have a beautiful building across the street from us on Main Street. I'm living in downtown and one big beef that I've had through all this construction is all these vehicles parking right on site. I wish we did a better job on controlling that. And as soon as COVID hit and when the train depot emptied out, they should have been required to park there, not suggested, required. I go for a lot of walks, my family does, and these guys are parking right in front of the property that they're working on just to be close to their vehicle for a cigarette break, whatever the case is, eat their lunch. But most of the properties that they're being worked on is half a block or a block away. And I don't know if any of you read Bob Crowley's email. Um, that was a very good email on his history of dealing with um, downtown parking for over 30 years. And um, I agree with a lot of what he said. And, and I agree with a lot of you tonight, but uh, maybe not tonight, or maybe you vote on some pieces of this, but we have to move forward. We have to, because as Mark said, before you know it, it's 2021, you know, hopefully things get a better, but, and what Chief Clark said, we can't, then we're going to rush, and then we're going to make too many mistakes. We have to do some phase-in approaches, 
and just bite the bullet on some of them and then fix fix it when it needs to be fixed. But um, we have to do something. Not not tonight, but we have to do something uh, soon. Karen, thank you. Thanks, Carol. Okay, I um I also understand how much work this has been for the staff, and I very much appreciate it. And I also uh, appreciate the complexity of this problem. Um, um, I would love to be able to vote on part of this, at least part of this e this evening. And also leasing um, seems to be an easy part to work on um, so that we don't have to, if we need to revisit this in pieces, we can make the pieces smaller and make some progress. Um, I'm gonna have some, um, if we discuss kiosks separately, I did have some questions. Again, we had asked for um, really a, not a return on investment because it's not, I don't think it was supposed to be a revenue project, but it was supposed to be, we did ask for numbers, letting us know what was gonna be the total outlay. When would the town be repaid? Um, at the last select board meeting, we specifically said, we're very concerned about making significant outlays at this point when we don't know what our larger uh, fiscal situation is during COVID. Um, I, for one, if we were going to take up Vanessa's plan and do some follow up. I, for one, would love to see. I would love to know more about our and our parking enforcement, how that works. Um, and again, getting back to the kiosks, then when the kiosks tell you your two hours are up, you still have an enforcement officer coming. But how does that all work? Um, those were some of my questions. I've um, I attended the parking meetings and. Um, February I did not attend. Oh, I mean, well, when I was in the select board in August when we talked about that. Um, and absolutely, um, I heard in February, I heard the climate advisory committee and other residents ask for this parking strategy to include um, electric vehicles, chargers, and it's still not part of this plan. So um, if we could find a way to move forward and partially get this project moving so that the staff could put aside certain parts of it and, and work on others and with a specific timeline to come back, I would be okay with that. Um, and I do understand that a pilot program is gonna produce some feedback that we can respond to. And it would be wonderful to have a specific date, just like the road diet that we would come back and take a look at how things have worked. Yeah, Ian, did you have a, a, a comment? And I see Bob's hand, I know Julie definitely wants to talk about some things and I want to hear her thoughts on on uh, notice and notification. I think that's important that we hear that. Right, Ian. I just thought I would um, put out there the questions that I had re relating to um, data privacy um, around a pay, pay by plate scheme for parking kiosks. That was my kind of um, my first question that I had when I, uh, I think it might have been back in February, the first time um, we were were um, presented with this proposal. Um, and I did get some information from Julie um, that, um, um, that Matt had, had provided back in March, um, you know, under a proposed plate, pay by plate system as currently envisioned who would own and have access to the data, the town, the vendor, both. Um, I appreciate that from a, 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 a enforcement and a, a utilization, understanding utilization perspective, pay by plate would allow for a lot of data collection and analysis. Um, my concern at, from a privacy perspective is that it would allow for a lot of data collection. Um, and analysis. Uh, and analysis. Um, so I understand from Matt that um, it's a, uh, this was what he had provided to Julie in, in response to, to my questions. Uh, a little unclear about how the data is provided. Typically the full plate is provided as part of the system. The key issue here is to ensure data use policies are clear and limit the ability of law enforcement to use the data. Um, the same with data retention policies should also be put in place to limit ability to track behavior. Um, Matt talked a little bit about uh, an analogizing this to um, an easy pass and how um, there are strict data usage policies there. Um, so, but I haven't heard anything specific as to how, and Matt, you might have more information. Um, 
I, I don't know that I would be able to vote um, in the affirmative on, on any pay by plate scheme unless there were assurances of, um, of, of how data was going to be used and retained. Because I do have concerns about um, collecting um, data on residents' whereabouts, locations, and movements. So. Thanks, Anne. Bob? I don't know if Matt wanted to respond. I wasn't, I wasn't sure. Um, yeah, I think that you do have to have policies in place um, and there's good examples out there about how you do retain data or how it's being used. Um, and if that's formalized, um, that's a really strong thing to do so that you can assuage fears about that. Um, I do think that there are some strong advantages to pay by plate um, purely from um, a logistical kind of side. Um, it's less maintenance in terms of for the town itself, so you're not constantly adding signage for paid for which space someone's in, all those kinds of things. Um, I also think, you know, I think you can look to, you know, things like MassDOT, et cetera, um, for those kinds of policies and, that you would adopt. Um, I, I think in order for you to vote tonight on whether or not you want kiosks, you can decide whether or not that's pay by plate or pay by space later. I, th what you're really voting on is whether or not you want to have kiosks. Many communities switch from plates from pay by plate to pay by space. Actually, I don't know any that have done that. I've known that many who've gone from space to plate. Um, I think it's an advantage. Um, I understand that the, safe, the, the privacy concerns, et cetera. I also think there's the reality too, is that almost anyone who's gonna be parking there, first of all, it's, not, it's, it's people everywhere. The vast majority of communities now are doing this by plate because it is a more efficient way to do it. Anybody who has a concern of that, I would be surprised then they, they probably aren't going to be driving on the Mass Pike or the Tobin Bridge. Um, it's, it's a technology that is really effective. Um, you're already looking, most communities are already in some ways when it comes to, if you think of parking citations, for instance, like I know many communities, if you have five you know, or more, whatever your number is of unpaid parking tickets, that's what, that's the ability to tow. So, you know, it's, it just has to do with how you want to use any information, what, what level of information you want to get, but that's at the discretion of, of the community. Um, if you, if you want to pass, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, I would say some kind of a requirement that if paid by plate is being used for this, that none of that information may be used for anything other than parking. I think that's a wise thing to do. Um, and then you, I would look for many of the templates. I'm not a lawyer, um, so I'm not get, I can't get into all the legalese, but I know that there are so many examples of this happening. And it's a, it's a valid concern. You know, that's why communities are not allowing facial recognition at, you know, different stores, you know, I mean, Target's doing it every time you go in. So it's, I think you just have to, you have to be very aware of how that data is being used. I think you have to be very public about it. You have to be forthright about where you're not using it so that the public knows so that it can't be used in a, in a nefarious way. Not that I would think anyone would use it that way, but that's the fear. Thanks. Mark, if I can ask Jean and Julie a question. I've, I've never quite faced this situation before. Um, the board has closed the public hearing. So my best understanding is they can't continue this discussion and vote next meeting without re-advertising a public hearing. Is that correct? Yeah, probably. Yeah, so so the board could take votes tonight. You're still in the hearing. It's, it's, it was posted for today. But I don't believe that you can continue this hearing. Norm, normally when hearings are continued, from my experience, it's before they're closed. There's an obvious reason why there's some reason why the hearing can't finish it tonight. So you don't close it, you continue it, but the board's already closed it. So I believe we would have to re-advertise, which I'm pretty sure knocks October 6th out because we, I think we need a two week notification. So I just wanted to make sure the board was aware of that sort of technicality. And, um, you know, unless Jean or Julie is sure that we can take it up in two weeks, I would say we can't. You guys have had more experience with hearings. So the only thing is that, you know, which I don't think is what is desired here is if there were no new information and no more public input, then potentially they could talk about it again. But I don't think that's what's intended. Yeah. Yep. So I, I think that, you know, our solution to that probably would be to have to have a separate meeting, an additional separate meeting, you know, potentially on the 13th of October, if that's what we so, you know, if everyone desired that. But 
before before we go there, so uh, Julie, wanted to get your input. Oh yeah, so I just want to just quickly circle back to the notification issue, and um, I hear what you're saying. Um, we we miss the mark, it seems, on that. And I'm not, my, my comment isn't meant to change any minds or persuade anyone of anything different. Um, I did wanna shed some light into why we did what we did this time around. Um, and partially, um, we, you know, the, the last meeting we heard from residents sort of outside of what we would consider even like the greater downtown area who were interested, who didn't wanna be left out of any notification that we did. So that's why we looked to put um, like a physical paper mailing in something that we thought, you know, every resident who pays an, um, a water bill would get. And it would be something that they wouldn't just rip up as like junk mail because, you know, they need to open their water bill. So we wanted to make it as visible as we could to as large of a geography as we could. Um, that, that definitely is a general way of notifying people. Um, and then to, for a more targeted outreach, we looked to code red um, because we understand that a lot we, there are a lot of subscribers and that you know I, I get it myself and it, it's nice that it comes through on a text and it's not just another thing coming in the mail. So we wanted to kind of take a multi-pronged approach to how we reached out um, regarding this this issue. And then I also followed up with emails to a, a very large contact list that I have. So I hear what you're saying that we missed the mark a little bit, but there was some logic and thought behind the process that we utilized. Julie, when were when was the code red? Was it one or was it multiple? There were two. Um, there was one that went out. I don't remember the exact date. It might have been. It was prior to my September Zoom info session, so it was probably um, the week of like the last week of August or two weeks, potentially the second. To August twentieth. August twentieth. Okay. Five thirty at night. And would that have gone to? Um, essentially all the folks um, that are in the outer core as well as it, the inner core? Yeah, it went to a, actually a, a boundary. I, I can send you the, the exact boundary, but it was a quite, quite wide, um, very inclusive, you know, way more than we typically would consider the downtown. Got it. So, so just, we, we've always, we, all of us here, have always struggled with what's the best way to reach out to the community. And, and get input and it, it continues to be a struggle in terms of how to do it um you know no one or two or three sources are sufficient it takes kind of everything it, it's like an all of the above and even with that we're going to miss some people as well it, it, and again i, I you know I'm, I'm hearing enough people that are are very concerned um that that don't feel they received any notification and we need to pay attention to that um but I, you know, I, Julie, I appreciate your, your your sharing. I mean, I think there there was a, a, a very strong attempt at outreach, um, and I think it's an and, not an or. It's an and. We need to do more somehow. Sorry, so Vanessa, I saw your hand. Thanks. Um, so, Mark, I, sort of back to my original proposal of how we move this forward because it's it's ten o'clock and we still have numerous other items that we're supposed to get to tonight. Um, so again, I suggest that we ask the staff to tease out the areas um, that the board can review at whenever our next meeting is. Um, it, and maybe it is a special meeting in order to allow for the hearing to be posted again, because now we are changing potentially some of these motions um, and highlight those so that we can move forward with them. Um, and then we spend the rest of, you know, maybe it's the next 15 minutes and, and just crank out a list, not discuss the pros and cons of each of these things, but just say these are the things that we want information on from the staff so that they can come back to us and then we can discuss it moving forward. And then a timeline and a plan for outreach for the next series of meetings. And if this is such a top, hot topic issue, maybe we schedule a separate meeting. Um, sort of a standalone hearing. And maybe that's a better approach because otherwise we're, we're just going to keep going in circles. Um, and my last comment is regarding kiosks. Um, I, I, it's not clear to me if we're going to be voting on those tonight or not. Um, I am strongly against kiosks in town. I think they are incredibly problematic. Um, I think they're going to discourage people from parking to run quick errands and they're going to go elsewhere. Um, you know, I think before we move to the idea of kiosks, 
we should implement these other ideas that have been discussed, um, moving the employees out, changing the two hour parking, um, and, and see what happens there because the kiosks are $60,000 just to get them installed at a minimum. We haven't seen a business plan for what the maintenance is going to cost. Um, I saw something about staff needs. So I don't, I'm unclear on if that's a new staff member or a new part-time staff member that's gonna be required. And, and the funding alone for this for me um, is, is a hard no. So I, I am vehemently opposed to kiosk parking anywhere in the downtown area at this time. Um, I can answer some of that. I can't change your mind on a lot of it, but um, kiosks are very inexpensive compared to any numbers you've mentioned. Um, Matt can go into detail, Julie can go into detail. The reason we didn't do a significant financial analysis is because it really is not a big factor. Your, your policies are a much, more, much bigger factor than the cost. So Matt, why don't you just sort of review, you know, ballpark is 50, 10 to 15,000. Yeah, I mean, so kiosks, the reason you go with kiosks as opposed to meters, for instance, is they are far more affordable and they actually provide far, often far more information. You know, um, for instance, if you're, if you decided to eventually at one point do meters, um, every single meter has a cost, every single meter has a maintenance issue, every single meter has um, actually a collection need. Um, the reason you go with kiosks is that, first of all, they provide a lot of, you know, valuable information about, you know, your current utilization of that lot. Um, they are, it's one to two per lot. Um, there's also other ways. The other way, reason why it's good is it's very easy for enforcement. So what happens with, just for instance, with minimal staff change, if you already have enforcement and you have um, officers, what you, you do literally is you go to the lot, you can print out every plate that is currently parked there and you can walk or space if that's how you went the number and you know exactly who's paid and who hasn't. It's actually very quick. Um, whereas compared to right now, if you're talking about enforcement by not having any kind of kiosk in, the, in particularly the CBS lot, which is very highly used, particularly in the middle of the day, you're now asking, you have to then technically either, now by law, you can, you can digitally chalk, you can't actually chalk a tire to see if they've moved. Um, it becomes a much more over time efficient way of actually managing that parking, just to, I mean, just to put it simply, it also makes it very easy to provide warnings and citations because you know exactly who, how long someone's been there and whether or not they've paid. The cost is actually very small. Um, I know that when you actually think of the revenue that will be generated from that, it's actually not going to be, um, you'd probably pay for it within the first year. Um, if you didn't, and very few things that municipalities do pay themselves within a year, quite frankly, if they ever pay off themselves. So I, I think that's a really, um, it's a bit of um, a tricky thing for people to understand in that sense, because it is an upfront cost, but that 15,000 per the Per, and that's a high end for kiosk that includes installation that includes getting that concrete pad that has to be placed there that that if it's electric that includes getting the if as long as there's an electric source nearby which you would check that includes that or you can go with solar um, for instance so I think that from a parking perspective kiosks to me are one of the most cost effective ways to do parking management um, they just really simplify things and then quite frankly what they do is that if people want, you know, what you do is you give that month or so for people to get used to it. Once they've used it, they know how to use it. But also they also are great with integrating a parking application. Um, whether in, in what you- in Matt, excuse me. I, I'm just gonna interrupt for a moment. Um, Mark, again, I'm just, I'm just gonna reiterate. It is 10 o'clock. We still need to discuss the town manager goals and I'm not even clear off on if we're voting on kiosks. But as a matter, I, I really do appreciate the information that you're providing. Um, but we as the board have not been presented with a business plan that incorporates all of these wonderful details that will allow us to make a more informed decision. So Mark, you know, I'm going to ask that, you know, can we discuss what we're going to do with the rest of those, there's almost two dozen motions that we're supposed to be voting on tonight. Are we doing that? Are we, you know, how are we moving this forward? So I think um, what you're suggesting and what I think we can do here is I'm gonna stop discussion completely and I'm gonna reopen it on one topic. And that is what questions does the board have that it would like to see resolved by, I'm gonna pick a date of October 13th that would allow us to vote on 
some or all of these items. I'm looking at the calendar, the timeline, and it looks like as it relates to, uh, and, and Chief helped me here, um, for the employee permits, as an example, it's eight weeks minimum, 12 weeks preferred, regulatory signs, six weeks minimum, eight weeks preferred, so that something accomplished in October could still achieve these time limits. You're getting tight, Mark, to be honest. And again, I, I don't want to put any pressure on you. I, I, I understand it's been a long night. There's a lot to go over. And believe me, I appreciate that. But it just means that we might not be able to enforce certain things starting on January 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. I could be looking in the middle of January with no enforcement because stuff has expired. Or we might need to become with, come to you with um, amendments asking for extensions on things um, as well as results. So that's kind of like, so we are just getting close with that. Got it. But so, but if, if, if we're doing something soon, if the board can come up with a list of what it needs and we can meet again in that soon time frame to come as close as we can to those timelines to get as close to a January implementation as possible. And if we're able to answer most of the questions, perhaps we can vote on most of the items. If we're only able to answer some of the questions, maybe it's only some of the items. Um, but the board doesn't seem ready to move ahead um, right now. And instead of, I, I don't think our time is best spent talking about kiosks and costs right now, um, but rather what are the things that we're looking for? So I think that's where we should head right now. Um, and so I guess the, the, what I'm suggesting is that we would not vote on these items tonight unless something like, you know, what I've heard so far from people is that the issue of leased spaces seems non-controversial. Am I, am I hearing that from virtually everybody? I agree to that statement. Yes. Mark, I think the issue Julie raised was that um, that has a ripple effect because the leased spaces are what are currently being used by employees. So for removing that as employee parking and converting it to two hour parking, then those employees, however many hundreds some odd these spaces exist, um, those people now no longer have places to park. So unless those, they move into areas that are unregulated, which is an option. Yeah, do those become two hour or are they two hour or employee? I can, I can screen share the proposal and I actually think that the leasing program can stand on its own. I don't think it will create a drastic ripple effect and I can explain why, but I'll share my screen really first. Yeah. But, and then Carlo has had a comment next. Sorry, this is the wrong slide. Um, so I can go back to the map as well if we need it, but the, there are 58 leased spaces. Um, 41 of those spaces are on High Street, and those would turn into public two hour or all day with employee permit um, under our proposal right now. So um, those, a lot of those 41 spaces are being used by businesses or are leased by businesses right now, and they, they would just be lumped back into the employee permit program. So they could be utilized by businesses again in the future. Um, and then there are four spaces on Brandy Court, and those are the four that would become public two hour. Um, and, and then there are 13 in the Harnden Yard lot and that there's a variety of ideas for the different spaces in that lot. And I have it on a map if it's easier, but um, there are some areas that, that seem warranted for public two hour or all day with employee permit. And then the spaces in the center would be public two hour. And then there would be spaces that would be police business only. Okay, Carlo. Thanks, Mark. I was actually just asking to see these slides. So yeah. <laughs> perfect. Would it help you, you staff, if we were to vote on that tonight? It would be, it would be great. <laughs> Mark, yes, that would that would have an impact. Um, at least something we could move on and make some changes to. Um, that that would actually be helpful. Okay, so let me suggest this then. Why don't we focus on two things? One is to review the uh, specifics on lease spaces to make sure we're comfortable with that, answer any questions as one. And then item two is to um, look at the remaining items, if you will, come up with a list tonight during this meeting of questions that we have that we'd like to see resolved, and then come up with a date at which we would like to uh, have another meeting and I guess public hearing and meeting. And I think the idea of dedicated is exactly right. 
and let's make sure that we're 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 focused on it and, and see if, what information we're able to gather in that time frame and then vote on it. It's all right. Okay. So Mark, Mark, can I just ask a question of probably police before you do that? Sure. I just want to make sure we're we're knowing what page we're on. Um, if you folks can look at the uh, motions, I actually, why don't I share a screen just to make it simple. So Julie, I'm going to take yours away. Um, can people read that? Does it need to be a little larger? A little bigger. Okay. Yep. I'm going to read a list of the motions that I think are relevant to leasing, and I just need someone to confirm it. Um, 2020-4, 2020-5, And there's one more, Bob, it's on the second page. It's about Herndon Yard. Yeah, there it is, 2020-22. Does that sound like a complete set? Yes. Okay, I just wanted to make sure we were on the right page here, thanks. Okay, so, uh, Board members, why don't we address leased spaces specifically, and then we'll move from there to uh, a specific discussion of what we would be looking for in order to make further decisions. So Julie, can you um, put up the slide on lease spaces, please? Okay, so we're talking about the amendments four, five, six, seven, and 22, referring to High Street, Brandy Court, and Harnden Yard. Just a quick question, there are one, two, three, five, five amendments in three areas, just to make sure we understand what and why. I, I didn't think seven was included. There are four amendments, I'm sorry, okay. I spoke. Four, five, six, yes, and 22. Sorry. Yes. Okay, so the same question, there, there are three areas and four amendments. Because one is for the program in general. Great, thank you. And just to, just to kind of reiterate for myself, we talked about the biggest issue going on here is that they're not fully utilized. Um, that sometimes they're used, sometimes they're not. And to open it up to uh, an opportunity for to our public or for employee parking permits um, we feel allows for much better utilization of those spaces and much more regular utilization of those spaces. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions from board members? Mark, I'm all set. To, I'm ready to vote when everyone else is ready. I'm ready. Karen, Vanessa? I'm ready. Okay. Uh, Let's shift back. Uh, Bob, I don't have those motions. If you could put those back up, please. Certainly. <clears throat> and um, I'm gonna suggest that you renumber 22 to seven, just because that's how the PTTF or the manual goes. So I will do that here. Yep, and just do it in red if you don't mind. I was just gonna say, let me just turn on track changes just in case. And for laughs, I'll make this one 22. <laughs> so the motion could be four, five, six, and seven. All right, look, I ask you to make that motion, please. Uh, before we jump to that, for anyone who is following along at home, this is starting on page 39 of our packet that goes into the exact details of um, the areas and just a little bit more information than is provided here in these summaries. Carla, you are, oh, there you go. Yep. Sorry, uh, we're doing each individual motion, correct? Or all together? I think we could put them together. Yeah, you know what, let's not, let's just do it. Let's be clear. Okay. Go ahead. Let's go each one. Okay. Move that the board approve traffic and parking regulations amendment number 2020-4 as presented slash amended leasing program. Is there a second? Second. Thanks, Karen, discussion? Let's take a vote. Uh, Carlo? Yes. Ann? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. Karen? Yes. Mark, yes. 
Next one. Move that the board approve traffic and parking regulations amendment number 2020-5 as presented slash amended lease space, leased spaces high street. Is there a second? Thanks, Karen. Discussion? Not appearing. Carlo? Yes. Ann? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. Karen? Yes. And Mark, yes. Thank you. Next motion. Move that the board approve traffic and parking regulations amendment number 2020-6 as presented slash amended leased spaces, Brandy Court. Is there a second? Second. Thanks, Karen. Discussion? Let's take a vote. Carlo? Yes. Ann? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. Karen? Yes. Mark, yes. And the last one, please. Move that the board approve traffic and parking, oh, sorry. Move that the board approve traffic and parking relations amendment number 2020-7 as presented, presented slash amended lease spaces Hardin Yard. Is there a second? Second. Thanks, Karen. Discussion? Let's take a vote. Carlo? Yes. Ann? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. Karen? Yes. And Mark, yes. Thank you. We went through those. Okay, great. Now let's uh, talk about what we would be looking for specifically for a meeting to take place. Let's use a placeholder of October 13th. What issues would we like to have addressed um, specifically, I guess, by that time? Um, I would be open to hearing from individual members on their thoughts and we can kind of uh, make sure we're in agreement. Sure, I'll go first. Great. Um, I'm, I'm still looking. So I understand Julie's comment earlier. They haven't really, folks, y'all haven't um, um, did a deep dive, haven't done a deep dive into the costs related to the kiosk, but I am seeing staff, software, installation, maintenance. And if this is commonly done by not lots of communities, let's reuse some data out there. So we understand what the initial investment is, what the annual investment is, the staff that's needed to use them and um you know any service plans and and a projected um income stream please and I, i'm not gonna say we need this by two weeks from tonight but i i i'm asking for information on where electric chargers public electric vehicle chargers would fit into our parking plan and that's pretty much the two items thank you Vanessa? I already talked a lot. I was going to let everybody else go first and then just fill in the blank. <laughs> Ann or Carlo, you want to go next? Carlo, I see you're, you're unmuted, but you look frozen. Oh, there you go. You're back. Sorry, I was just looking at some of my slides. Um, I don't have any specific questions. Um, I know there's a lot of work that has been done and some more work needed to be done. Um, I, I just am ready to move forward in the, in the most efficient way. So I'll uh, kick it up to Ann. Quick, can I, can I quick, I forgot one. I'm sorry. I, I asked for information about our enforcement staff. How does parking enforcement work in Reading? Can like a one slide, what staff do we have? When are they working? How often do they work? I'd love some visibility into that. Thank you. Sorry, all done. Thanks, Karen. Ann? Um, Matt spoke to this a little bit already, but I think it would be helpful to have in writing um, how we can safeguard um, user data, um, what kind of data retention um, and usage policy can we have, and, and perhaps significantly, how would we formulate a motion um, to protect said data uh, from a privacy perspective? Um, and then my, my outstanding questions and concerns are really about notice. And I don't know that you laid that out as one of the things we are going to do, but I thought it would be, I would think from for the staff, it would be helpful to hear from the board about what our actual expectations are with respect to notice. Um, and I would, I would like to see, um, a letter be sent um, either mailed or 
um, stuck to the door of, of residents on, on affected streets. And I, 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 for, I know Vanessa has some thinking around um, a broader than the inner and the outer core, but I, I'm thinking that I'm, for me, I'd be satisfied with people whose streets are, um, are within the plan for changes. If you're, if you're, if parking is changing on your street, you should receive an actual notice either in the mail or stuck to your door. Um, and on that, would a notice say, <clears throat> you know, charge, uh, to be simple, parking's changing on your street. Please visit the website for more information. And there's a meeting on X date. Is that sufficient? Um, making clear that the, the parking changes are affecting their street. Um, I think as, and if you're pointing to them to the right direction, in the right direction, or with a phone number, that would be, I mean, the more specific, the better, but it, I understand that could be onerous if there are different letters that have to go to different streets. Right. Um, yeah, that's I do, why I it does need to, I do want it to indicate that there are changes impacting their street, not simply downtown parking, um, because yep. folks in the outer core may not consider themselves to be downtown, even if they're, you know, technically designated in the district, they may not, you know, they may, you hear downtown and you may think Haven Street and Main Street. Okay, thank you. To Anne's point, I was paying very much attention to the town spraying notices and I was always looking for my street to know where they were coming. So I think that's a, that's a really good point. Great. Let me add a couple of comments and then I'll let, uh, I'll let you close uh, on it, Vanessa. So um, Bob, your point on having some kind of a, a specific session where the letters are, are pointing people, um, I think is very important. I think that it does need to be by Zoom, but I think we need to make sure that people know they can join by telephone as an option. So that if they don't do Zoom or they don't have internet access or they're not comfortable or just don't want to, they can join by phone. Um, I think Outer Core, I agree, um, it suffices at this point. I understand that. Um, on the point of enforcement, um, could you folks also talk about if we implement these changes, what enforcement changes do you plan or, or expect to, to do? Uh, and I want to take kind of Matt's point also, which is that once there are new regulations, how will we work with those regulations? Um, who will do it? And I think Carlo brought up the issue of you know, hours and things like that. How, how is it going to be implemented um, so that, in fact, once we've made these changes, we can offer friendly suggestions early on about this isn't okay, you need to park elsewhere, and then eventually uh, enforcement so that people do not park there when they're not supposed to. Um, third, back to the kiosk discussion um, and, and thinking about chargers and things. I think the mo one of the important things is that if we are going to dig anything up for, let's say, kiosks, we should be talking to RMLD and figuring out how to get power to that location and have some charging station opportunities set up. There's no reason to dig it up once for kiosks and another time for charging stations. It should happen one time. It'll be much more efficient to do it that way. And I think it's, it's an important idea that we want to get done. We talked about it at our last meeting in terms of chargers as a priority. Th these are the spots. These are great spots to get started. Um, Mark, we, we can do that, but we were thinking solar. Solar in terms of? The kiosks powered by solar. Well, the presentation still says that both options are being looked at, so, but yep. your point is taken, solar is an option. Yep. And does the, the solar ones allow for uh, the data issues, the data transmission? Do they have enough power to do that as well? Yeah, I don't think there's any difference. Okay. What you, what the one thing you need, which we're not 100% sure we have to study is uh, internet access in the two locations. We think it's fine, but we gotta look. Yeah, they're probably 5G. Okay, um, so so not related to dig, digging up, although if we're doing any digging up, we definitely wanna do it then. But I would like to be, if we're talking about changing these lots, I'd like to uh, talk about charging stations. And I think RMLD would be a willing partner in the discussion. Um, I, th I think that the charger itself may not cost us anything. Um, I think armed with those issues, I'm prepared to, to vote on these topics. Vanessa. 
Thanks, Mark. Um, so I agree with, with essentially everything everyone um, listed for the employee permit program. Um, I noticed that the first month of implementation uh, of the plan for, for these, uh, for any significant changes that we make is limiting it to five passes per business. However, um, that leaves certain types of businesses, I'm thinking hair salons and dentists and, and any others who employ large quantities of employees, maybe not all at the same time. Um, it leaves them in a very challenging position of not having any parking available for their employees in any of these areas for the first month. Um, and if that implementation is going to be in January, um, that's going to be a safety problem for their employees. Um, so I, I'd like to know what is going to be done to address those businesses. Um, for kiosks, um, while I have already said that I oppose them, um, I would like to have more information on maintenance costs, um, what the lifespan of the equipment is, because if they need to be replaced at a certain time frame, that will need to be incorporated into the budget, um, because at that point it becomes an operating cost. Um, I'm curious to know what our peer communities are doing, because I want to be clear, we are not Andover and we are not Winchester. We do not have um, the same dynamic downtown that some of these other communities have. And if we're trying to attract people, I am very worried if we are comparing ourselves to cities, which we are not. Um, Bob mentioned the internet uh, access. Um, is that going to be a cost? Um, there was also mention of um, additional parts of the program that could be there, um, including validation, monthly or other tiered passes. Uh, is there going to be an extra cost from the third party provider uh, for these services? Are they add on features that we have to pay for as a town to maintain them? Um, there was mention of employee administration in order to manage the program. Um, is that anticipated to be done with existing staff? And if so, what are they being pulled away from in order to manage this program? Or is this going to be an add on from a cost perspective? Because in my mind, that again goes into the operating cost. We've now added an employee. Um, so it's not just the um, initial installation from a cost perspective. All right. Um, the Ann already touched on the notification calendar. I want to know what the outreach plan is and what that's going to look like. Um, because, you know, we've fallen short on this for other topics and I want to make sure we get this one right. Um, the one area that I think needs to happen is um, looking into how it's going to affect surrounding areas. There are, you know, some of the other neighbors mentioned the fact that Linden and Sanborn are parallel or perpendicular to other streets that aren't touched because technically those streets don't count as downtown. But they're going to be affected when all of these parking implementations go into effect. Um, when the parking depot fee was changed to $150, I said there's going to be ripple effects in the surrounding communities. And sure enough, there were. I heard from my neighbors, because I was in that area, um, of getting blocked in in the winter. Um, and they couldn't get out of their driveways because people who used to park there and the depot didn't want to park anymore. Um, so we need to be sensitive to what this is going to do to other neighborhoods. Uh, I don't think that's something we can brush aside because we'll be dealing with it uh, six months after we implement the changes. Um, for the streets where parking is being proposed to be banned on one side, um, the topic of tree lawns came up from one of our residents. So is the town going to enforce not parking on tree lawns? Um, is because it's going to present um, snow removal issues, um, aesthetic issues and liability issues for the town if we allow people to either gravel over or park on tree lawns. So what's the plan there? Um, so for the streets that we're converting to uh, employee parking, does the town become responsible and liable for snow removal um, and lighting to make those areas safe? Um, I mentioned this earlier, has the DPW been consulted and are we removing any 
no storage spaces on some of these narrow streets by putting parking in those areas. Um, and the last one, electric charging stations, um, I echo everything Mark and Karen said. That's it. Awesome. Two, two quick uh, comments if I could. One, um, I think that as it relates to the businesses that could use more than five passes, I think you actually have collected the data about how many passes people would, would want. So maybe that we can just utilize some of that to, to be very helpful and speed that up. Um, and the second issue that I forgot completely on kiosks, and thanks for bringing up kind of the best practices on that, Vanessa. Um, a number of people have talked about the issue of 30 minutes being too short. And again, thinking about best practices, what would happen if we used one hour as the, uh, the free period and anything after that requires validation? What does that do to how the structure works? Who's, who's, who's done that? Who knows what will happen? How do we figure that out? Because I think that might address a number of the issues that were brought up by people. It won't, it won't affect the karate studio, I get it, but maybe not the doctor's office, but a lot of the others, I think it definitely would. Any other you know, last shots that folks want to add? Mark, can I chime in for two seconds? Yes, please. All right. Um, just to answer one question or one of the issues, um, uh, Vanessa, you might not have been the only one that brought it up, but um, as far as the employee parking with the free five, we want to put some type of limitation on it so that a business doesn't come in and grab 15 that doesn't need it, um, and potentially maybe hand it out to a family member that's commuting into Boston or something. My administrative staff that hands out them always has the flexibility. We have the data that, the, that Julie, Aaron, and Jean have worked on hard. And I've always given them the flexibility to make a decision based on what the business needs. But we had to come up with some number just so they weren't all getting snagged up the first month either. So my staff will have the flexibility, again, based on data that has been provided to us by town staff and this business needs. And I've always kind of given them that flexibility. So it's it's just it's one way to regulate it but in the same token it's we will be flexible it's not like a hard line rule if that helps answer some of the um concerns with that it does that's very helpful thank you um and it's nice to know the staff has that flexibility i think um one of the things i'd heard from businesses is if you know i i, I don't remember who said it earlier I, I think it was mark that if a business comes in mid-year um there's no more passes available. So what happens when a business like Dimitri's goes out of business? Um, you know, how do we, how, obviously passes don't get returned. Um, so how do we handle that inventory to allow businesses to secure passes? Um, because in the, in the past, it's just been a hard no. There's a set number and once those are gone for the year, that's it. And that's why we um, looked at limiting the amount of passes handed out before like a business came in they could grab 25 another business grab 30 they might not actually need it and the fact that they're hanging tags we've also asked the businesses to if you have two employees one works an eight hour day one day a week and another one can they come into the business grab the pass and put it in the car just for that day um and that way we have an extra supply left over a few leftovers so when a new business comes in, perfect example, the Amici's, a new business does come in, we can then provide them with the passes because we have extra ones. That's why we're looking to add um, more employee spaces to allow us to have more passes to do that. But we can also kind of um, regulate that. And also when the uh, business in the past, when they let an employee go, weren't collecting the passes back. So we've actually informed businesses, just like if you take a key to the building back or an email password to get in, when you take that back, have the pass as part of the what you take back as, as um, issued by the business. So we've been trying to educate the businesses on that as well. That's great. That's wonderful. Um, maybe we, they're, they're required to put down a deposit. <laughs> there you go. Um, board members, anything else? Have we covered what we want to have covered? <clears throat> Karen. So are we sending letters to the same businesses who are very concerned about the parking that we temporarily lost this summer? Are they really okay with this idea of kiosks or they have not thought about their elderly patients and their elderly pets having to truck over to a kiosk and then truck back and get into the, get in and get out? I mean. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, one thing I wanted to, to bring up, it doesn't directly answer that, but it's an important piece of it um, that I learned also. And that is, and, and maybe we'll, we'll let Matt kind of um, talk to this for a second also. Um, the kiosk we're talking about would accept you can talk to it by smartphone you can pay the credit card you can put in cash 
maybe even coins, but I'll let someone else answer it on coins. But it's got enough flexibility to accept different payment types without requiring you to you know, get a parking app to get things done. Totally yeah. saw that. The issue that the concern that came up when we lost some of those handicap spots and those parking spots was I have to shuffle over to that kiosk after it's extra walking for people that can't do that walking. And let me just put it to Matt also. My understanding is that if you have a handicap access sticker in your car, you don't need to pay at meters. Is that correct? You don't, there's, if you have a handicap placard, you can park anywhere without any restriction and paying. That doesn't matter what community you're in. There you go. I also want to say that's the advantage. One of the concerns that people say that that the pain about either um, like pay and display, for instance, like original kiosks had like pay and display where you'd have to go to the kiosk, get a printout, and then go back to your car. That's one of the advantages of either pay by space or by pay by plate. You go to the kiosk once and that's the only time you have to go. Um, the other advantage of, for instance, this is one of the reasons why pay by plate is great with the parking apps, because essentially once you have that app, your, your, your license plate is, you put it in your kind of like your wallet so that it, when you pay your parking the first time and then you use it, it already, it will hold that in it. So whenever you pay the next time, you don't have to go through that process of identifying the space or, or remembering your plate, it's already stored in there. Cool. So my point is just the notification again, notifying in writing, written, this affects you. That's why we're sending you this letter. <laughs> yep. And if you have comments, send them to us and or come to the meeting. If it would be helpful, I'm sure someone on the board would be happy to review the letter um, to, to ensure that our um, high demands uh, are represented. I think I hear Vanessa I, I would be happy to do, to do that. <laughs> I said, I would be happy to do that. I think that's a good idea. Um, staff and board members, given this list that we've just generated for you, um, do you think it's feasible to have a public hearing on the 13th of October, which would give us more than two weeks notice? And I'm just wondering if that gives you the time to accomplish what we've asked. I would say not to accomplish the rest of the tasks that were presented to you tonight and that you've listed here. It's a question of whether the board wants to try to take another small bite and whether that's even practical. And we won't, we won't know that till staff really meets tomorrow to discuss. So, you know, why don't I get you some feedback after tomorrow's meeting as to next steps? That, that still gives us plenty of time to hold a meeting in October if you want to. Does that work for all? Great, great, that's perfect. So your, your timing of the meeting tomorrow, sorry that it's not gonna be for the exact reason you'd hoped, but at least it's perfectly utilized. Um, I think we close this topic. Good. Great. Thanks, folks. Let's move on. We have a couple more things we have to do. Uh, we have to appoint members. We have to do warrant. Let's get going. Uh, let's go to Mark, Matt. Can we take a two minute break? I realize it's late, but it would be nice to stand up. <laughs> it's 1043. Can we come back in, in, in just a couple of minutes? So 1045. Thanks.
Thanks, Sam and Karen. <laughs> So Mark, um, <clears throat> by contract, do we need to tackle the goals tonight too, or can can't talk about it until we're oh okay in session? Sorry, sorry, I thought it was a process question. Do we get to vote on Halloween? Take a vote on Halloween or take a vote yeah. about Halloween? <laughs> no, can we vote? My Zoom background, how's that? Because it's nighttime. Oh, there's a beach. There we go. So it's late. There you go. Oh, <sighs> oh I feel better already. The tree is blowing. Oh, that's awesome. It looks like your hair is blowing in the breeze. How I'm going to go put a fan on. Oh, yeah, that'd be great, huh? <laughs> Can I be where you are? Yeah. <laughs> right, before we do that, we are, we are well, back in session. <laughs> um, we are on the next item of the agenda, which is to vote to appoint members to the Board of Health and ZBA. So, um, BASC members, um, can you talk to us about both of those uh, positions and recommendations, please? Sure. Colorado, do you want to start? Uh, sure, yeah. Karen and I met on, I don't know what day it was now, but we met with the candidates. and Monday night, 5 p.m. Monday night, yes. Sorry. Um, and it went well. And we had uh, two candidates applying for one position. And we had Dr. Lopez, uh, who agreed to become um, the chair. Uh, that's not up to us, but you know he will take that position on. Uh, so that solves that problem. And then we interviewed one candidate uh, for the ZBA. And unfortunately, there's even more openings on the ZBA and then, than the one that's open. And the person that we interviewed, uh, who's an attorney, uh, was willing to be a full member. So that will satisfy the full membership, but we'll still have two associates for the ZBA. So this, this is a commercial for the ZBA that we need more applicants and more volunteers. And um, that was it. And Karen and I kind of came to a consensus on the Board of Health that maybe Karen can share. And there was only one applicant for the ZBA and she was comfortable with being a full member and can attend the meetings and is ready to move forward. Karen. Yep. Um, yes, um, Dr. Lopra, Dr. Richard Lopez. Um, he's getting along well with the board. They're all working together nicely and he is willing to step up to be a full member. So we thanked him and told him we would recommend that his wish be granted. Um, and then the two other members, they're both incredibly, incredibly qualified. So we're just struggling with um, how to how to recommend one and still um, 
say thank you, please, to the other candidate. We don't need you at this moment, but we could very much, we could need you in 30 days or 60 days or four months and not both equally qualified. It's, um, so um, actually, Caitlin, do you have her, it's, uh, what is Jerry's last name? I think Carlo and I decided um, that we would put forward, um, Jerry, what's her last name? Hammer. C-R-A-M-E-R. Thank you. And she seems, in my opinion, and Carlo can um, disagree, uh, she seems um, to have a little more flexibility in her career. The other candidate, uh, Brian Healy, incredibly well qualified. Um, uh, you know, either would be, serve ably and very well. Um, so I would love to have him not give up on us and be available. But I, th I think at this point, Jerry um, would be a great candidate for the board of health. Okay, so your recommendations are uh, Dr. Richard Lopez for the full member yep. and uh, Jerry Kramer as the associate. Kramer, thank you, yes. Great, uh, board members, any questions of the VASC or discussion? Um, was there any conversation with Brian about, and he may already be doing this, I can't quite recall about um, sort of advising the Board of Health or being on call for you know as assistance with, no, there wasn't any conversation about that. Okay. I didn't ask him. I knew that several of the candidates that we had interviewed were on call yeah, and available. I don't remember if he if he is engaged in some in some capacity already, because I had remembered that Eleanor had reached out to all of the past applicants. He may have been one of them. I, I, I'm not recalling, but thank you. I appreciate your recommendations and and your. Um, well, Jerry had definitely mentioned. She spoke up and said, "I I have attended a few of the meetings recently." Um, Brian didn't happen to mention that, so I don't know. I mean, we're all he's pretty busy here. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Great. I'm comfortable with the with the recommendations. I I have a question actually for the vast. Um, so I noticed um, as I reviewed their resumes that Brian. Hold on, they're a little out of order. Uh, that Brian Healy um, is a biostatistician, statistician, biostatistician. Um, that seems like a particularly valuable skill set to have that I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, um, is currently represented amongst our Board of Health members. Um, I mean, I, you know, we have two incredibly well qualified um, um, applicants, which I think is a wonderful problem to have. Um, it's just given what we're dealing with right now with COVID um, and the how statistics play a key role in, in how we implement policy. Uh, I'm curious if you discussed that aspect of his experience and how it could contribute to the town. I didn't know. I think either of these candidates. You Jerry and Brian twice. Um, well, this is our second time. And exactly what you said, both qualified. And it just seems at this time that Brian has a much busier life. It's kind of, you know, Karen and I talked after the meeting. And the, I think the, the occasional command meeting, even he was a little concerned about that. Not to say that that won't, that couldn't change and we couldn't convince him and we won't need him, but yeah. Yeah, that was that was our kind of our not a main decision uh, the, the way to decide, but it just three kids, a busy job, busy life, coaching soccer, um, and just you know, and we think we think he could do it. He, he said he could do it, but there was some reservation in in his voice, um, and that and that's really what did it for me, you know more than qualified. I wanted to pick them last time. I, I mean, I think this to me speaks of a broader issue of how we use staff um, within the health department, because if, if the demand for these volunteers is so high that we're churning through four within a couple of months, I mean, that's, that's a serious problem. At a certain point, we're going to run out of qualified candidates. Um, and, and that's just a really bad boom rate. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm sort of disappointed to see um, that someone with expertise in biostatistics, um, you know, is sort of being disqualified 
um, because the demands of the role are too high. Um, so, I mean, my preference would be um, Brian um, with a shift in responsibilities to the staff for command meetings, which is it's odd to me because I, I don't think Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I don't think there are any other, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, but I don't think there's any other volunteers that participate in that. And, you know, and, and, you know, the select board was thrown in you know, quite late into that process, whereas the Board of Health has been there since the beginning um, for the very reason that the staff has been representing the board um, for, for many months. So that would be my inclination. I think the statistics pass around is, is more valuable at this point. Um, Carrie and I are having an ongoing discussion. Um, as you can appreciate, um, you know, the various chairs have slightly different views, although much in common for sure. Um, and, and the concern is they've now gone down to a twice a month meeting schedule, which is relaxing compared to what they were doing. Uh, but their, their biggest concern, and this is really not who's doing what work, but just if the pandemic does come back in the winter and they have to go back to a one or two meetings a week schedule to make sure they have that flexibility. And that would be a burden on any of them. Um, you know, and I have no opinion on the candidates. I'm just reflecting the conversation I've had with Kerry. Um, I would say that the workload on the chair is, is a fair topic for what you're discussing, but not necessarily for how often the board meets. Well, I mean, then that, you know, other towns are not operating with this model. Um, and so we're, you know, it's possible okay. that we appoint yeah, Jerry and, and we burn through them as well. I, I really have Mar to- I'm not, Bob, I'm not sure if you were able to hear what I was saying. Um, I that if, if we are burning through volunteers at this rate, it's possible that you would appoint Jerry now and then we have to go to the next one on the line um, to Brian. Uh, so, it, in my view, it's not about how many command meetings they have to attend or whether the chair has more responsibilities. It has to do with the fact that other towns don't, aren't making these demands of their boards of health. Yeah, I think that we're in agreement that there needs to be a restructuring in the board of health and either it follows along kind of what Eleanor sent to us with hiring a director um, and or it starts with what Carrie is recommending in terms of an, a study that gets done. But those, although very related to what we're talking about, they don't really relate, I think, to the candidate that we're going to bring into the role right now. Um, interestingly, I don't know either candidate, but I just looked in the background of Jerry. She's an RN with a PhD in population health. Um, so I, I, I think we're in one of those situations where we have exceptional candidates and it's hard to decide who would be best. Um, but I think that the, the VAST did their, their job. And you know one of the things is just to make sure there's some flexibility um, that's possible, or excuse me, it's preferred that that flexibility is there. And it sounds, I don't think we can make a bad choice here. Um, and my inclination is to follow the recommendation of the VASC. I'm fine with that, with the understanding that as a future agenda item, we will take this up because I don't wanna turn through another batch of board of health members. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that the topic may be um, health department, perhaps uh, more so than, than Board of Health. Yeah, um, I agree, very much related, and it's not okay to churn through, through members, and COVID could do who knows what. So we need to have a, a structure that supports people, um, and, and hopefully that means less burnout that comes from it. Agreed. So uh, I'm fine with the recommendation put forward with the VASC then. Cool. Um, so let's do the, the Board of Health first. Um, I don't have a motion written out, Carlo, but can you uh, just kind of improvise one? Mark, did you get the email, the motions I sent you earlier? Oh, sorry. I kind of, when I went off email, I didn't come back. So I truly, I just get into the- Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I, I can find them and post them if that's helpful. If you've got it quicker, I'm going to just open my email now, but if you've already got it, that's even better. Yeah, I, I have it.
Oh, I don't actually think I see it there, but okay. So if you can see the screen, I'll make it a little bigger. We're down to the VASC section. I got it. I got it. You guys ready? Ready. Ready. Move to appoint Richard Lopez to a full member on the Board of Health with a term expiring June 30th, 2022. Is there a second? Second. Thanks, Karen. Any discussion? Let's take a vote. Uh, Anne? Yes. Karen? Yes. Carlo? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. And Mark, yes. Thank you. Next motion. Move to appoint Jerry Kramer to an associate position on the Board of Health with a term expiring June 30th, 2021. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Karen. Discussion? Not appearing. Let's take a vote. Anne? Yes. Karen? Yes. Carlo? Yes. Vanessa? Sorry, you're muted. You're still muted. There you go. You're open now. Yes. Thank you. And Mark, yes. Five zero. Um, and then you mentioned there was one candidate for ZBA, and you folks yep. are recommending that candidate? Yes. Yep. Move to appoint Cynthia Hartman to a full position on the Zoning Board of Appeals with a term expiring June 30th, 2023. Is there a second? Second. Thanks, Karen. I have a question. Please go ahead, Vanessa. Um, so it looks like this individual um, is an attorney um, with, a, with a practice um, with a focus on real estate, uh, commercial and residential. Um, my only question is, were conflict of interest discussed with this candidate? They were, yes. This is something. Um, and what was the result of that conversation? There was no conflict of interest. And if there was going to be one in a particular meeting, she would recuse herself. OK. Um, it might be. This is just a sensitive topic. And, and I know it's come up before. Um, you know, given her professional role, I think it might be valuable to have a conversation um, with legal counsel. Um, not just for her, but for anyone who may be new to the board, um, so that they understand when it is necessary for them to recuse themselves, uh, because it's it's not always straightforward. Don't don't you just need to read the conflict of interest as a as a as a member of a board or committee? You need to read the rules on conflicts of interest. Her experience as a real estate attorney has actually been quite valuable because um, she doesn't work in Reading, however, but she has dealt with. Um, easements, variances, all of the things that the ZBA is going to be making decisions of. So um, it's it's definitely an asset. But, you know, in general, I don't think we need to talk to legal counsel. I think you just need to understand. Oh, sorry. No, I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. Let me clarify. Um, I, um, I I think her her qualifications are, are great. Um, my question is or my suggestion is that that um, legal counsel, as, as she's a new member, um, advise her on when she's required to recuse herself or disclose anything that could be perceived as a conflict of interest as, a, as an onboarding practice for, for something like ZBA. Okay. It, it may just this be issue that's come up, so. rather than taking town council's time, you know, letting new um, members know that they, they should do the ethics training, the ethics commission training. I, I think that'd be great. Yeah, I do think that is um, that is a strong open meeting law. Um, yep, ethics training. I think I don't know if we have anything in place to let brand new yes board or committee members know that this is you need to read this. This is your onboarding training. Okay, that's a great suggestion. I think I think um, cool. Clark provides at least some of that to new to new members as they get sworn in. At some point, we you know onboarding is is something that we have talked about and um, haven't taken further action on in terms of onboarding for particular roles in general, but but here being a, even a little bit more specific to conflict of interest. So that may be something we want to put uh, onto our discussion plate kind of further down the road. Any other discussion? So we had a motion. I believe we had a second. Karen, did you second it? 
I second that motion. Great. Okay, so let's take a vote on, sorry, I just looked at her qualifications, on uh, Cynthia Hartman. So, Anne? Yes. Karen? Yes. Carlo? Yes. Mark? That's Mark. Okay, Vanessa? <laughs> Excuse me. It's late for me, even. <laughs> I'm sorry, Vanessa, I couldn't hear. I was laughing too hard. Uh, I was waiting to make sure you were talking to me and not yourself. Uh, yes. <laughs> So that Vanessa votes yes, and this Mark votes yes. <laughs> okay, um, we need to do the warrant, um, and then we need to have a quick discussion. Um, so let's do, let's look at the warrant. There's an updated version that Bob sent out um, this afternoon. And Mark, and I have an amendment um, that I emailed to you all, and Bob has a copy. I was hoping he could help put it up on the screen. Can you identify where it is, Karen? I emailed it to us all. Bob um, has a copy of it. Oh, oh it is on oh, article, article 12. Sorry, Article 12, the purpose. Yeah, does the board want to walk through them sequentially or is just a couple questions and be done with it? Uh, Except for these two changes, I'm comfortable with the, the warrant article. Is it? A, I mean, sorry, the full warrant as it is. I agree. Okay, just for also. disclosure, the, the version I sent to the board uh, just before the meeting uh, basically uh, allows changes from the moderator's request to hold a virtual town meeting. And um, you know, Mark remembers this, I don't, that we did ask the other town meeting in June whether they would do this or not. And uh, in this case, it has to be in the warrant because previously it was just the warrant was already closed. Mm. So that's that's the bulk of the changes you see on the screen. Um, I, Karen, I, I can put yours up if you want. Yep, sure. If we're done with this one, yep. So confirming, we are having a virtual town meeting. I'd seen the the command notes made it sound like it was up in the air, but that's now outdated, and we are having a virtual town meeting. Well, the, the moderator has requested it. It's up to the body to do it, but we're going to plan for it, and and okay. I guess hope for. Right. So Bo this is the body meaning town meeting or the yes. right town so, meeting has to vote the first night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this was the first item that we had for discussion at the last town meeting. So the town meeting opened and then the town moderator um, put up a vote on this topic just to confirm that the body was uh, willing to have it as virtual. And once that passed, they were able to proceed. So I believe this is exactly the same thing. That's just the requirement to get things started. What command has been doing is um, making sure that, first of all, any technology or other issues related to the virtual town meeting are, are accounted for and you know, learn from anything that didn't work. Second is there may be people that decide to attend in person. There could be more, there could be less, there could be the same number, but that needs to be accommodated. So that has to be discussed. Um, and then the, I guess the third option would be if for some reason the, the town meeting body decided that they would not have a virtual town meeting, then arrangements have to be made for a, a physical town meeting um, in November. So. I so. think people like the ability to have snacks. So. <laughs> I think snacks, I think bathroom was a plus. Um, <laughs> And I think the other thing from my perspective is the number of attendees, I believe, was a record. It was a record. Yeah. Uh, the participation was was extensive. Um, so I, I think that's all to the good. Uh, so did anybody have any comments other than the changes that we're seeing on Bob's screen? So change number one is, is the, the verbiage for uh, the virtual town meeting. Um, sorry, the change here was, OK, accommodating yes. that, right? Just to correct that uh, the town meeting was really June, not March. Uh, yeah, okay. Which I really wasn't sure. And then there's a small thing here at the end. Necessary or incidental to the acquisition. And, and we haven't really talked about this. Um, I can if you wish, but it's, it's just a very generous donation. And its ultimate destination is Conscom and um, as of yesterday, uh, conservation is still working on what the right process is, whether it should go through town meeting or not. But it's very important to keep this in as a placeholder. If it's not needed, it can be tabled, not a problem. 
but the ultimate destination for this parcel is con conservation. Got it. So this is the donation of, sorry, about 13 acres of property. Yeah, it's, it's just to the south, southeast of the parcel the town meeting reviewed um, a year or two ago in the Timberneck Swamp. Timberneck Swamp. Great. So this, the, this article would be to allow the town to... Um, accept it as a gift. Yes, yeah, not acquire. Accept. Okay. Right. And there may be some incidental costs. So that's the change being requested here. Okay, great. And then, sorry, Karen. Uh, Karen, yeah, let me find. Um, let me find Karen's. Uh, um, and I'm I have afraid it. I'm going to kick everyone off the meeting if I try to do it myself because I've never done it. I have, I can, I've got it, I can share you it. You do that for some reason, I don't see it. Oh, there it is. Well, if you got it, yeah, there you go. So Karen, do you wanna walk us through this please? Yes, um, there are two pages here. Um, the second page was the original Warren article and um, it's a, uh, a global <clears throat> remove and replace. So um, I expressed a concern two weeks ago about the way the stretch code article was written, not about the legal aspect, I'm not an attorney, but the purpose put some limitations, reference green communities and put some limitations over the implementation of it. And um, I expressed my own layman's concerns. Um, and then I followed up by um, speaking with um, Department of um, Energy um, and, and I forget what the deal we are. Neil Duffy, who also is um, um, heavily involved in green communities. And I also went out and looked at a number of other towns. So um, other bylaws in other towns are very, very straightforward. Um, you just adopt the stretch energy code. So you don't put anything in there like this. this. This is putting some kind of weird limitations. It mentions a program that might go away at some point. Um, so. In speaking with Neil Duffy, he said that we, I'm going to quote him, we should not be putting any stipulations in our bylaw. <clears throat> the stretch code itself defines how it will be applied. Um, Reading cannot actually make any further modifications, you know, building size, anything like that. Um, it is not allowed by law. So the cleanest um, way to do this is to just adopt the stretch code um, as is. Um, in fact, Looking down below at 7103, it explains what the stretch code is, what it'll do. We honestly, in my opinion, we don't need a purpose, but um, every town seems to have their own format for bylaws. So not having gotten any feedback from staff, I'm kind of just assuming they just want to stick to a consistent format. So the new sentence in there specifically says we are just going to adopt uh, the any stretch code bylaw. Um, and it's consistent with towns like almost exactly the same as Andover, Brookline, a number of other communities. So there's nothing, um, there's nothing legal in there. This is, a, this is an English language description, but what it does not do is it does not attempt to um, add any further stipulations to the scratch code. We can't do that. And this is the essentially what the 280 some odd other communities have have done also 283 they every well it was interesting the ones that you can find online actually are by are by laws are very easy to find other communities aren't but when you can find them um um they're consistent um or i should say they're not consistent they have all, all different formats but you don't get into like the philosophical purpose of the town and you just definitely can't attempt to put any parameters about how it will be applied. The um, building inspector, the building department, he is the enforcement authority. This is an extension of the building code. That probably makes sense to Bob if I'm not saying it correctly. And um, yeah. Okay, um, I'm fine with this change. Others? Uh, Mark, I feel like I meet, need to make a comment. Um, everything uh, Karen says may be absolutely true, uh, but I didn't see this till seven o'clock tonight and town council has never seen it. Um, I did ask town council uh, 
uh, specifically Karen's question and just never heard back. I reminded them again uh, yesterday morning. I assume that this change is innocuous. Um, I assume that if there's some reason why town council used other language and it's necessary, and I don't know that it is, I'm not saying that it is. I'm just saying this is not usually how we do bylaws. And I'm not a lawyer, so I can't represent what the impact of a change like this is. It looks simple to me, it looks innocuous, but yeah. just so I've said that I don't know, I, again, I can't swear to that. Why, Karen, I actually had thought you said you shouldn't put a purpose in there, but then there's a, the red is you, this red is your language, right? So the format that our staff has put together for bylaws includes a purpose. I see. So I was just not looking to mess with this and, and, and edit it any more than we needed to. Um, so Bob, I'm, I'm surprised to hear you say that. Um, so Neil Duffy also said that someone from Reading Town Council did reach out to him and he told her the same thing. We just cannot, he said, you should just adopt the stretch code. Your purpose should be, we're just going to adopt the stretch code. That's all it is. That, that's great. I just haven't heard from town council and I just needed to tell you that. Yeah. And Thanks. also that's not, but that's not what this purpose here says. Um, yeah, if you want, um, I can. I have a couple other cut and paste that I did just to show you what other towns are doing. Um, I mean, I'm just, if DOER said don't, in, include a purpose other than the purpose is to adopt the stretch energy code, then maybe that's what it should yeah, say. Yeah, let me show you. Mark, can I email you one more document that you could just put up? Yeah, so I was actually, I have Brooklines. I'm just scrolling oh, through it Belmont, as fast as I can. Belmont, Andover, Chelmsford, Brookline. They're all pretty much the same. Okay. Um, it's, give me one second. I'm, I'm, I'm going to shoot very this close. You and all and Bob now, if you want. So what, so Anne, what I found in looking at other bylaw formats is you, what I was saying is it's not consistent that they do it in the similar format that we do, that they, they might not have a purpose. And some of them put in there like adopted on the date. I mean, just, I guess there's some flexibility you can, on how you can do the it. The purpose better. language is, is what you borrowed from other communities. Yes. Uh, not looking to reinvent the wheel. 283 other communities have already done this. So this is Brookline. Yeah. So just let me, so here's their, this is their bylaw stretch energy code. Purpose okay. to provide more energy efficient alternative yeah, so to the base code. That other stuff, only the purpose. And that's- So I'm in agreement with Anne here, where if the state recommendation is not to include a purpose, then we should probably not include a purpose and keep it as simple as possible. Um, so he didn't tell me just to be clear. I'm sorry. I wasn't clear. He didn't say we couldn't include a purpose. He said, you shouldn't be putting any stipulations in there, any parameters. You shouldn't be attempting to describe what you're going to do with the stretch code. You need to just adopt the stretch code. This is just an English language. That's all this is. It's saying we're going to adopt it. As is, we're not going to apply it. We're not going to say it only applies to green buildings, blue buildings, red buildings. Um, that's what the previous can, language was saying, so we can't do that. Can we go back to the proposed changes? Oh, sorry. Um, hang on, let me fumble in the background without sharing my screen just for a second. Okay, here it is. Is that the version you're looking for? We could close the warrant with this language, but town council could provide us for town meeting, you know, if there needs to be a, a comma or, or a rewrite, we could, there could be an amendment on town meeting floor. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that fairly regularly we have town council providing updates 
um, and then having the body accept them. I think the concern I'm would fine be with this as is. Yeah, yeah, I think if we're I'm moving overly forward restrictive, meeting if needed. Yeah, I think if we're overly restrictive, um, then that gets harder to, to make the changes. Whereas we're we're a bit more generic to start. It, if, if anything, it's broader. But it's, it's not actually broader. It's actually more more precise. And the way this is written, it's we only only reading is, and maybe this is a new way and better way of doing it. Re reading is referencing 7080 CMR Appendix 115 AA. Everybody else is not everybody else. Other people are, are referencing just 780 CMR. And Ian, I don't even know what that is. So I'm an attorney. So I don't want to mess with putting any of that in there. The purpose is not required by law. And that it's not, it's just kind of a stylistic thing. <laughs> just Did you get be. anything um, in writing yeah. from GOER? Um, no, I have a voicemail with it where him saying exactly the same thing if you want. It's just some, um, not every um, bylaw has a purpose. They, there's I'm, no I'm, I'm fine with this for purposes of closing the warrant. Okay. I think it might be helpful to, you know, hear from town council. Um, yes, and I did request that several times. That. And, um, but not changing this, we would have been approving a warrant article that was incorrectly written. And I wasn't gonna let you guys do that. Even if this isn't perfect. At least we're not we're not doing something wrong, which is what the previous language was doing. Um, Bob, can you put up the motion? Sorry, I don't seem to have that email with motions on it tonight. Um, I will. I just added Karen's language to the document I'm using for the warrant. Great. So this this is a replacement. Um, I'll you know we'll use what she said in case I got it wrong. But I think I, I think I got it right. Great. And there are no changes further in the document, correct? Correct. Okay, great. So let's take a look at a motion. Uh, is that okay to read? Yes. Yep. Here you go. Okay. Move to close the warrant consisting of 13 articles for November town meeting to be held on November 9th, 2020. Is there a second? Second. Thanks, Karen. Any further discussion? No, nope. let's take a vote. Uh, Ann? Yes. Karen? Yes. Carlo? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. And Mark, yes. Great, so we've closed the warrant. Um, folks, I'm gonna suggest that we not work on town manager goals tonight, if that's acceptable, Bob, to you, as well as to, to all the members, just because it's 1123. And I don't think we're gonna do justice to anything. Um, I, I, it's perfectly acceptable to me and we can proceed any way you want, but if board members wanna send individual written comments, I'm certainly receptive. That might help move along when the discussion happens. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Just, just you know, my my quick comment. I thought you did a very good job incorporating a lot of what we discussed, and certainly uh, the spirit. I saw it. I saw it all there. I have a couple of quick comments that I'm happy to send over. Uh, okay. I don't know how others feel, but that would that was my quick take on things. And Mark, I think it it merits public discussion. I mean, I can send my notes over, but um, I, I think it merits public discussion. So I was Both for our benefit and the public. Yeah, no, I completely agree. We need to go through it and we need to discuss it and vote on it both in public session. So uh, no issues with that. My suggestion is the following. I think we should talk about the October 20th agenda logistics, um, which is related to the Auburn Street Tower. Um, and then take a quick look at future uh, items specifically for the 6th of October meeting. And, and I think we as a placeholder of the 13th. Um, and then we, um, I would defer everything else until October 6th, if that's acceptable to folks. Is that all right? Yeah, great. Okay, October 20th, agenda logistics. Um, a number of us have been in touch individually with um, many of the residents and abutters to the Auburn Street Tower. Um, I reached out um, as of yesterday, might have been this morning, I think it was yesterday, that's before midnight, um, to, to see what their thoughts were in terms of how 
to present uh, conceivably at the October 20th meeting. And I'm gonna quickly, if I can, I'm just gonna grab the comments um, so I get them exactly right. But the essence of it was they have yet to meet as a community to discuss how they'd like to approach it. Um, but a few folks have talked to a few other folks and they seem, um, okay, I found it here. Um, what they're gonna to recommend to the neighborhood on the upcoming call is that neighborhood representatives, two or three reps, they would ask that they be allowed 30 minutes for an initial presentation. Additional citizens who wish to speak could get three minutes. Um, and neighborhood representatives will get a chance to respond to, to statements. So that would be their, that was their request in terms of format. What I was thinking is that um, we have some comments that we've all heard, and certainly there are letters that have come in. Maybe each member would, in addition to that, want to create a list of questions they would like answered, either from neighborhood input or for their own, their own questions. Compile that information, send it off to Bob, and then ask that staff review that, turn it into, a, I'll call it a QA, and a um, so that they're able to answer a number of the questions or explore some of the questions that range from, you know, why does this have to be here? Or what are the options? How does this work? Things like that. And to make sure that that would, in the worst case, be in our packet in advance of the 620 meeting, or perhaps even sooner if it turns out that that's possible. That would allow everyone to read through it, to, to kind of see what some of the discussion already has been, and then make our meeting on the 20th more productive instead of kind of starting at square one again. Does that seem like a reasonable approach to folks? Wait, um, what is our deadline? Right, yeah, I think that's very important to set a deadline. Um, in, in ASAP, and let's pick a date, but it's got to be ASAP. You know, if we said the end of this week, would that work for everybody? For questions on the cell tower? Yes. I, I'd, I'd actually like a little bit more time if I could, like okay. to next week, next week. Like Monday? How about, how about the weekend? We can have the yeah, weekend to do it. I think that would be nice. To have. Okay, so to have them to Bob before, you know, Monday morning first thing. So send it out Sunday night. Great. And then those would be the questions that we use structurally. Sorry, Carla. I've been wanting to put some time to look at old videos and packets and I haven't, you know, I think if I could have the weekend to do that, that would be helpful. That'd be great. And I think what we really want to make sure of is that town staff has a chance to look at them and, you know, hopefully they have answers to many of them and others that they'll do some research on. I think that makes the meeting much more productive. Sorry, Carla. Thanks. Just a quick question. Is the 20th, um, resident feedback only are we getting a, an update and a presentation on a proposed cell tower not a cell tower what's an update for the water tower or is that is this is that night really resident feedback resident resident comments only what what are your thoughts myself yes oh i would love an update on the, the meeting that we had in june on you know because the water tower has already been funded by us uh, by town meeting to are we going to break ground in you know next spring um, and then obviously there's a bigger discussion of the cell tower or not a cell tower and where to put the equipment and then a temporary space for the equipment which doesn't seem to be too difficult but um, there's a lot going on well there will be a lot going on on that site and I, I know we've all met with some residents and read a lot of emails and spoken to people on the phone. Uh, all five of us have, if I'm sure Bob and staff have as well. So sure. I personally would love an update on when are we moving forward with at least a water tower portion because that has to get done. Right. And some kind of timeline and then address everything else. But the water tower, I know we can't keep on pushing that too far unless we can, I, I, I didn't think we could. Yeah, I think that sounds right, one second. I think that sounds right. And uh, perhaps what the what staff could do is, um, and this will be embodied in the questions, discuss some options that might be available as it relates to cell tower. Um, you know, the cell tower, no cell tower, what could happen? What can carriers do versus what do we have to do? Are there any legal obligations related to that? Just so that, there can be a discussion about options can start to take place. Again, I, I didn't anticipate we'd resolve things on the 20th, but 
but we'd have a lot of information. We would hear some options and we could decide kind of where to go next from there. That was my thought. Sorry, Vanessa. Um, thanks, Mark. So I, I have a couple of suggestions on, on how we can move this forward on the 20th. Um, for, before I jump to that though, Bob, I had emailed you last week. I had asked if you could send me a copy of the RFP that was sent out as well as um, apparently there was some security study that was conducted. Um, that might be helpful for the rest of the board um, as well, if you could be so kind as to send that to us this week. Um, and then for the security study, if there is um, any information that's potentially problematic, if it were to be disclosed to the public, can you let us know so we make sure not to keep that confidential? If there's not and it speaks in generalities and the public can see it, great. Um, but I want to be sensitive to any to releasing any security information. Um, so that's one. Two, um, I suggest that from a homework perspective, I know um, we have had various presentations on this over the course of the last, say, two to three years. Um, if, and I'll be honest, I, I don't remember the exact dates. I know one was um, July, and I want to say one was June of each of the previous two years. Um, if, if Bob or someone on staff can send us the exact dates of when we discussed those topics. And then if everyone from the board could review those sections again, so that we're not asking similar questions um, that have already been answered in meetings. I, I don't think the discussions are that long, but I think they're half an hour each. Um, and then for night of on the 20th, um, I recommend that uh, if the board agrees that we ask the, the staff to put together a presentation of no more than two or three slides with the options that have been presented to date. Um, so that the focus of the meeting on the 20th is not a giant rehash of everything because the information is already public, um, but simply just to highlight what the options before the board are. Separate cell tower, quick list of pros and cons, um, combined with the water tower, quick list of pros and cons. I mean, I'm talking like top five, three to five bullets max. Um, so that it's very clear what is being asked of the board and what the community can expect. Um, Carlo, you mentioned the timeline. I fully agree um, for when that's needed. And then we would have public comment and then the board discussion. And I think it, you know, from the from the perspective of the residents that I've talked to, that they've made it very clear that they do not want a cell tower, that they want us to vote against a separate cell tower. So setting expectations up front for what we're voting on or not voting on, um, I, I think would be wise. I think one way or another at the end of the 20th, we should have a vote on something, whether it's to instruct the staff to do something more or to vote against something or for something else. But I, you know, so I think we ran into problems by not voting last time. So the, the only way I can see that working is not just by looking at what's already been discussed, it also has to include options that may be newly generated that either weren't thought of before or weren't presented before, or frankly, were discarded before. Because I'm not comfortable that we have enough options on the plate currently. I'm not ready to, to vote on it. It's a, here it is, it's A or B. We're not there. I'm not ready to make that vote. I'm not comfortable with that. I would agree. So I, we need to see some other options and Without that, I'm, I'm just I'm uncomfortable saying that we will take a final vote on the 20th. I don't know that we're in a position to do that. Um, so my, how about this? If it's so funny that we're on different different sides of voting on or not voting on issues tonight, Mark. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I see your point. Um, how about this? If there is no new, if there are no new proposals and then we're only dealing with proposals that were put forth previously. At that point, it might be worthwhile. I, I'm trying not to drag this out. We, yeah. if, if there's no new information, so I don't see why we can't vote. I, my, my feeling is that if there's no new information, I would deem that an unacceptable result and, and that we, we really missed something here. There have to be other options. One option being leaving the equipment on the new tower, a la Peabody, if I understand correctly. Another could be saying to the carriers, 
you're going to be down for, for six months. Decide what you want to do about it. I have no idea what the legal ramifications, if any, are from that. See if they care. I don't know. Or I don't I have enough information to answer that. Yep. Okay. And I don't okay. know if, it was, if it's been approached yet or not. And it may be that it has, and we'll have information, and that's very helpful. It may also be that it hasn't been approached that way. I think the FAQs provided um, in advance of the meeting will be helpful, not just for the residents, but to us as well, because we probably all have the same questions of have there been any developments since this was last presented? Are there new options? Uh, right. And, and I have a feeling that the, the discussions that are going on now may be uh, generating the need for new ideas. <laughs> okay. Hoping that okay. that's the case. Let me, let me make a general comment. When we do presentations and put them in your packet, um, those are just the slides there. That's not the conversation. So when you look at a packet presentation, you don't hear the music as it were. Um, I'm concerned that if we try to short circuit a presentation, and I truly appreciate what Vanessa is trying to do, but I think the board needs the full story in as crisp a way as possible, I guess I'll say. Um, and, and I, you know, we can work towards the FAQs is certainly a good idea. We can work towards that. Um, but, you know, there's been examples where the board has cut off discussion and missed some points that would have been, would have come out, whether that makes any difference or not, none of us can say. Uh, but on this issue, I think you need to hear the full story so that there's no stone unturned in terms of, you know, now we have to go back and have another discussion because we didn't know about this, you know, Give us some time, let us lay it out there as much as possible in advance so you can read it. Um, but you know, I'll have to talk to staff as to how that how that works. Um, I believe we so want to have consultant and hey, let finish, please. Which would just, you know, much like the parking consultant tonight, is for your benefit to ask professional questions that we can't always answer. Great. Thanks. Vanessa. Sorry about Pat meant to interrupt. Um, uh, so Mark, I mean, this is a, this is a three hour discussion. If if the town, if the staff has to put forward a one hour presentation and the residents are going to want to talk for about an hour, right? Um, especially if we allow them time to give their presentation, which I think is a, is a worthwhile endeavor. Um, and then the board needs to have a conversation. That's at least another, that, that's three hours in a meeting that has a couple of other things plus the things we put off tonight. So I, I just want to be practical about. So hang on, you're, you're missing the meeting on the sixth. There is a meeting on the sixth, right before the twentieth. So there's one more meeting. Now your point is still quite valid because what we have on the <laughs> sixth, plus what we aren't covering tonight, um, and the, and and if we do parking on the thirteenth, it's still too much to to accomplish in October. Um, so yeah, you you really need to do tax classification. Right, so that tax like classification is, is set for the 20th also. So the two big things on the 20th are yeah, water tank cell carriers and tax classification. Um, and then that assumes, Bob, do you think that uh, town manager review, is, you'll be ready for the 6th? You'll have had a chance to review things by then? Yeah, um, it would be nice if you, we could add the goals discussion to that night. Uh, yeah. Mark, we need another meeting. Yeah, we do. So we, I think we need to count on the 13th. And it may be, Carla, what did you say about Halloween? <laughs> I'm free. Um, yeah, so I think we, we need to plan on the 13th. Um, and if we are going to make that parking only, assuming that things can happen in that time frame, if we are, um, well, first of all, do we need it to be parking only? Do we think we can accomplish in a couple of hours? It's a public hearing as well. No. Given what happened no. tonight, I'm, I'm not no. too confident. Okay, so let's make that the solo purpose of the 13th. Again, um, I, I want to meet with staff tomorrow to see if we can do that, so I don't want to assume that yet. Right. Okay, well, so even if we can't do that, I think we've got plenty of stuff to add to the 13th to have its own meeting. So let's count on the 13th as a meeting. And then the question is, do we also need the 27th? Well, let me just ask a question. 
Um, I assume that you do not want to change the cell carrier discussion from the 20th. And I know our assessors don't want to change tax classification from the 20th. So what other issues need to be added into the 13th? And maybe Mark, you want to talk to me offline, that's fine. Yeah, so I think one of the things we need to talk about is the water sewer rates that we uh, we have plugged in on the 6th. So maybe we have to decide if that stays on the 6th or not, but it's either the 6th or the 13th. We've had enough um, questions from residents that I think it's a, an important discussion to have. Um, yeah, and then so if we have both review and goals and tax classification, Mark, do you want to work through that offline with the town manager? Absolutely. Let's count on the 13th. Either that folks. or we'll shoot for midnight. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you, you are not far off, Bob. Um, so we'll take that offline. Count on the 13th, please, as a meeting date, and we'll, we'll see what we can fit into these times and see if we might need an additional meeting beyond that, which I think is, is quite possible here. And, and Mark, we can chat about this offline, but I just want to ask you in front of the board, um, what Zoom format do you lean to? Is it the town meeting style or is it the tonight style? And, and consider that you also have a tax classification hearing that night with an unknown amount of interest. So I, I just want to say that out loud. I, I'm take, I welcome all your feedback and, and Mark and I can work on that. Yeah. And if, if people don't have an objection to either webinar format like town meeting or what we're doing tonight where we're kind of inviting people in one by one, if no one has a, a, oh, you can't do X or you can't do Y, then then Bob and I can discuss and work it through. Unless someone has a very strong opinion, boy, I really want that webinar format. No opinion. The, um, my, my, my uh, concern about town meeting was that all we could see was the presenter. We couldn't see each other. That wasn't very conducive. Um, Right. There's a way we can let people in. Okay. Let me let me take that point. If it's okay with with folks, I'll work it through with Bob in terms of a structure that makes sense that allows. I think it's important for people to be able to see each other. So let's make sure that we're able to accommodate that. And then tonight, just as a quick FYI, because it was a public hearing, um, the best practice, even in the Zoom world, is to allow people to not only register in advance for a public hearing, but also during the course of the hearing to be um, allowed to speak, you know, if, if they say, hey, I'd like to speak, which is why we did that a little bit differently. That's different from regular public scheduled public comment. Scheduled public comment as we're doing it is, is kosher. Um, for public hearing, the best practice is to make sure that there's this broader opportunity to get input, uh, even if it's not uh, provided up front. Thank you, Mark. All right, so- Can we, we will... adjourn? What's that? <laughs> Can we adjourn? <laughs> no, we hang up for 17 more minutes. Um, I think that's a-, a Mark, I'll stay you. with you. <laughs> Are you ready to make a motion? <laughs> motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Thanks, Karen. Uh, let's take a vote. Anne? Yes. Karen? Yes. Carlo? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. Mark? Yes. Good night, folks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caitlin. Good night. Thanks, Thank Bob. You.